Good morning, everyone. My name is Bata. I'm the secretary to Judge Wiener. Uh, Judge Collipan's secretary is not available today, so I'll just be assisting with the proceedings. I uh, just wanted to check we have the legal team for the applicant here, as well as the respondent. Yes, Vim Tengo here for the respondents. Uh, my colleagues are here too. Yes, I confirm we are here. Thank you. For the applicants, for the applicant, rather. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to remind everybody else that's viewing the proceedings is that it is open to the public, but I'll just like to remind everyone to keep their microphones off as well as their video to reduce interference. Um, I will be muting anybody else that's um, not meant to be addressing the judges. Um, if their microphone is on and if their video is on uh, and you fail to turn it off, I'll probably end up removing you from the meeting as well. So please just bear that in mind. Um, and I think that is everything. Yes. All right, so we'll get started at nine o'clock as soon as all the judges arrive. Thank you. Maybe uh, they can be dealt with by the panelists and they can respond to the question that they can respond to.
sorry, just a, a, a just a housekeeping announcement. Um, we're just trying to ensure that we're all connected, and we trying to connect with uh, Judge Malheli. Um, he did indicate that he's in the process of trying to connect. Uh, we'll resume as soon as we're able to to connect. So. Uh, hopefully it shouldn't take us longer than a minute or two. Thank you. Thank you, my lord. Thanks, my lord.
my phone. Okay. Okay, let me just uh, connect myself properly and then uh, we can get going. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We uh, we can proceed. Good. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you. You may call the matter. Calling the matter of Elias Sekobelo Mahashule versus Sir Ramaphosa and two others, case number 23795 of 2021. Good. Thank you. The parties appear as they were yesterday. Um, Ms. Sello, is that correct? That is correct, uh, my lord. Good. Yesterday we Good, Mr. Trengo, good morning. Uh, we um, had concluded with um, Advocate Mpoh for finishing a substantial part of the applicant's case and, and you, uh, by agreement, would have had 45 minutes this morning uh, to uh, deal with the remaining two aspects of the applicant's case. So without much ado, uh, you, may, you may proceed. And you may proceed on the basis that we obviously have read the papers and you would see yesterday's hearing was really uh, focusing on the key issues and engaging with the court if need be. Thank you, Ms. Th thank you, my Lord. Um, at the outset, um, I must indicate that um, I have prepared and I will do my best to deliver my argument within the allotted 45 minutes. I would request, however, that um, as it, it, it is likely to happen, that the court would perhaps at some point or during the course of my argument require of me to provide certain clarification and pose questions. And depending on the number of questions I have to fill from the bench, I might be forced to go beyond 45 minutes. I do not intend to do so. So I hope Mr. Trengrove will also appreciate that it is not with an intention to encroach on his time. But if, so basically what I'm saying is if I were to deliver my submissions without interruption, I can do it in 45 minutes. That okay. I can assure the court. Thank you. You're not, you're not obviously inviting us not to interrupt you, but you're okay. simply saying that if we should interrupt you, then we should take it into account. Mm -hmm. And while I can't speak with Mr. Trengrove, I don't think you'll have a problem with that, provided that, as indicated yesterday, it's done consistently in the spirit of equality. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. In, Thank in, you. In, you in, 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 indeed, my Lord. I, yeah. I'm not inviting the court not to, <laughs> uh, tempted as I may be, but I shall not go that far. Good. Thank you. Um, I think I think that the starting point, as as if I may just say, if the as the court is aware, I'm addressing specifically the suspension of the first respondent and the subsequent issue of a letter of retraction and apology by the NEC to the applicant. Those so that those are the two issues that I, I concentrate on. For the record, we have maintained and the applicant has maintained in the pleadings that the suspension of the first respondent is valid and remains in force. And in the notice of motion, he seeks a declarator to this effect. We confirm that that is the position we hold in our heads of argument. And today I address the court to demonstrate that that suspension was validly effected and that it remains in force and that the a case for the declarator has been made. For reference purposes, I will not go there necessarily, but I will just indicate that the applicant deals with the issue of the first respondent um, suspension in his founding affidavit at paragraphs 118 and 119, and that is to be found at case lines page 00138 and 39. And in so doing, he invokes two sources of authority. The first, is that he was instructed by the NWC. And the second is the powers bestowed upon him in his capacity as Secretary General in terms of Rule 16.6.1 .6 of the Constitution of the ANC. These will be found at pages 001, 40, and 41. I will, in the full of time revert to these two authorities. But for the moment, I would like, regard being heard to the case as pleaded by the applicant, I would like to invite the court to have regard to the respondents, plural, uh, answer to, to these allegations. 
start, we'll start with the second respondent because we'll dispose of their second respondent's position momentarily. The second respondent merely denies that the, res the president, the first respondent of the organization, was lawfully suspended. And then she defers the entire matter to the first respondent to deal with in his affidavit. And this is at paragraph 101, page 003713. So the second respondent does not engage with the issue at all. So we are then left with the first respondent's affidavit to see how he deals. Um, so, sorry, can we just please repeat yesterday's announcement um, and request, Peter, perhaps if you could mute everybody and then um, whoever has an entitlement to be unmuted will unmute themselves and uh, the judges presiding and counsel who's addressing the court at that particular point uh, will unmute themselves and everybody else will remain muted. Thank you, Peter. If you could please activate that, it may just mean, Marcelo, that you might become muted and you uh, can then unmute yourself and this is not to impair your Audi rights in any way whatsoever. Uh, I appreciate that, my Lord. Uh, well, I appear to not be unmuted at the moment, so I shall continue assuming that the court can still hear me. Yes. As, as I, I suggested, I invite the court to the first respondent's affidavit because that is the only affidavit that deals with the suspension. And the first respondent deals with his suspension <laughs> from paragraph 12. And he makes reference to the letter he received from the applicant suspending him. Now, <clears throat> he will, he starts at paragraph 12 at page 003472 and he will deal with this matter right through to paragraph 32 of his answering affidavit at 003 page 480. In the interest of time, I will just quickly summarize the issues that he raises and I call the defenses that he raises to the claim that the letter is valid. Firstly, he suggests that uh, Mr. Mahashule wrote the sus issued the suspension letter in retaliation. And this he suggests at his paragraph 67 to 68 at page 003479. His second defense is that um, no one claimed, no structure claimed that he acted illegally. And this he does at paragraph 15 and paragraph 21 of his affidavit. The third is he relies on the ongoing litigation between himself as the president of the country and the public protector. The fourth is the IC, uh, the Integrity Committee report and its finding. And the fifth is that. Um, Mr. Mahashule was not authorized by the NWC on the 3rd of May to issue the suspension letter. I will, th these are the five broad defenses that are raised. I will dispose very quickly with the question of retaliation. We suggest that the, the point of retaliation falls to be rejected. And we say so on the following basis. According to the first respondent, the applicant was retaliating to the decision of the NWC of the 3rd of May. The second respondent as well makes the suggestion that this was a form of retaliation. But the second respondent suggests that Mr. Mahashule, as the Secretary General, was retaliating to his own suspension. So the respondents, even the respondents themselves, cannot make up what exact, make up their minds as to what the SG was retaliating to. Perhaps uh, appealing as the suggestion may be that he was retaliating, it falls to be rejected. As the second respondent on her own version admits, she doesn't remember when she signed uh, the letter suspending the, the Secretary General. We know both letters were delivered on the 5th. There is no evidence on record that um, the suspension of the Secretary General was effected by delivery of that letter before the first respondent was suspended. The second issue is <clears throat> the fact that 
the claim that, or the second defense, the claim that no one said he was acting illegally or he acted illegally in raising the CR17 campaign funds. And this he says, at, um, this is tied to the question of whether or not his contravention of the provisions of the constitution of the ANC are dependent on whether anybody or any structure of the ANC makes a declaration to the effect that he acted illegally <coughs> or whether it is an objective assessment regard being had to the resolutions and the constitution of the ANC. We suggest it's the latter. The fact that nobody told him that in so doing he was uh, he acted inconsistent with the resolution or the constitution is no defense to the fact that he did as the resolution prohibited. Interestingly, in, in, in his entire evidence, and no juncture does the first respondent suggest that I did not do as the Secretary General claims in the letter suspending me. That, that defense is not there. So there is a tacit admission that I did so. But in doing so, nobody told me that I, I have offended the provisions of the of the constitution or the resolutions of the ANC. He relies in large part on the question of guilt. And, and the question of guilt does not even arise. And for that, I would just quickly refer the court in any event to page 003647. And, and that uh, is C part an extra CR 17, the minutes of the 3rd of May 2021, CR 7, I apologize, CR 7, not 17. Okay. These are the May 2021, 3rd of May 2021 minutes of the NEC. At page 647, the NEC reminds at the in the last bullet point, and I'm reading somewhere mid towards the end of that bullet point, it was, and quote, it was emphasized that stepping aside is not an indication of guilt or innocence. So the question of guilt doesn't and should not even arise. For the respondent, first respondent, therefore, to have suggested uh, that nobody said was guilty is neither here nor there. It is an irrelevant factor. I, if I may just correct myself on CR7 minutes of 3rd May 2021, I call them the NEC meeting, that's the NWC meeting. I apologize for, for that. I then, what, what then is left of the first respondent's explanation and defense? The first <clears throat> is, is set out in paragraph 13 of the first respondent's answering affidavit. And that paragraph 13 starts with the words, and I read, the applicant never clearly articulated why he contended that I should be suspended, end quote. And he does so with reference to the, his suspension letter. And that suspension letter is to be found at SG6, at P001, page 78. Before I turn, sorry, Ms. Seller, can I just ask you? Um, that suspension letter was yes. it preceded by a hearing, and was Audi involved? No, my lady. So, are you not contradicting your own argument in respect of um, the applicant suspension, my lady? Uh, if her ladyship will recall, in the founding affidavit, as well as in the heads of argument, we depart from the premise that Rule 2570, depriving uh, the affected party of Audi is unconstitutional. Yes, you, you and, say that in your reply, but even on your, your other version, um, you suspended him pursuant to the SG's powers from the NASRIC um, resolution. Is that correct? Indeed so. Indeed so. Was a proper disciplinary procedure followed? Uh, my lady, I don't know what a pro proper disciplinary procedure followed exactly means in this case. Well, it, but it however, means I, what I, your 
what means what Mr. Mpofu referred to as Appendix 3. I, I, I will, my lady, in, uh, in time, address the resolution of the ANC that was invoked and whether or not in the context of what transpired, it was necessary or implied in that resolution that there must be Audi by the SG. So if her ladyship, if I could pack that question and if I get to the, that part and I haven't answered it, her ladyship uh, may repose the question and again challenge me whether or not uh, Audi was invo invoked in the sense. I, I, I think I prefer for you to deal with it now because it's, it's pivotal to this suspension. According to you, it's pivotal to the, to the um, applicant suspension, the proper procedures and uh, natural justice, etc. Okay. So I think if you could, I'd like you to deal with it now. Uh, I, I will, I will, my lady. <clears throat> the answer to whether or not Audi was granted to the first respondent has to be in the affirmative. It's a yes. It was uh, through the integrity committee that the Audi was granted. In, a, in accordance with the resolution of the 54th conference. Unlike with 2570, in this instance, it is not the decision maker that must grant the Audi. Resolutions of the 54th conference tell us who grants the Audi. And perhaps it might be an uh, opportune moment to refer to these resolutions. And those, if I could refer to our heads at 008, um, 29. And I do so simply because on page 29, the four resolutions have been captured there. Um, these resolutions are, as, as quoted in our heads at page 29, are consistent with ANC 2 to the second respondents, um, to the second respondents answering affidavit. Just remind, we me what, remind me what the Integrity Commission's decision was in respect of the, the first respondent. Um, to do that, uh, may, may I do so through the resolutions, my lady? I intend to do that. Okay. Okay. If, if we then have regard to the resolutions themselves, two and three, and uh, in ANC two, as, as uh, quoted in our heads at page 29, two requires that every cadre accused of or reported to be involved in corrupt act practices account to the integrity committee immediately or faces DC processes. Three says summarily suspend people who fail to give an acceptable explanation or to voluntarily step down while they face disciplinary investigative or prosecutorial procedures. We suggest that the two must be read together. Her ladyship wanted to know the, the conclusions of the IC in this regard. And the IC report, um, I want to is to be found, my lady, <clears throat> at page 003, 473, at 473. Sorry, just repeat that, 003, zero, 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 yes. 474, my apologies, 474. No. Uh, if I if I may try again, my lady. Third time lucky. Third time lucky, hopefully. Um, is it is it not an extra CR five? Uh, at uh, 636 to 642. 003636? Yes, it, it is. It, it is. Uh, it's CR5. Um, yes. I, was, I had hoped to, to refer to the, the other version tendered by the second respondent simply because of the strikeout application that we, we had. Okay. Previously argued. 
but it's still the same document and I'm, I'm happy to work off of this document. If, if we look at, uh, if, if I may suggest then on that basis that we rather look at 003974, that is the annexure of the second respondent. It is the same report. Yes. Now, uh, <clears throat> her ladyship inquired from me what the decision of the integrity re uh, commission was in this regard. And I submit there was no decision. And I say there was no decision for the following reasons. To understand, we must go back to this, to the first respondents allegations and in particular, <clears throat> at what he states, from as I said, from paragraph 12, he deals with his appearance at um, He deals with his appearance before the Integrity Committee from <coughs> paragraph 19, page 003474. At paragraph 19, <coughs> he suggests that when it was suggested that there might have been something untoward about the activities of the CR-17, I volunteered to represent myself to the ANC's integrity committee. He goes further to quote the minutes of the NEC meeting of the 28th to 30th August, and he said, uh, wherein the following is recorded, the NEC welcomes the readiness of the president to present himself out of his own initiative to the integrity commission to clarify the matters regarding the CR-17. 17 campaign funds. So that is the basis on which he suggests he appeared before the C before the integrity committee, and it is this, the basis on which he suggests uh, that the the committee did not make particular findings. But it is necessary to look at um, what the integrity committee actually did. If we look at the first paragraph of that integrity committee report, no, the second paragraph, it states the IC first requested to meet with Comrade President in 2018 when the issues of Busasa and the CR campaign funds first arose. The IC identified this as a very important and sensitive issue for the organization and anticipated that this was going to do damage to the reputation and good standing <laughs> of the ANC. The use of such allegedly huge sums of money for individual and leadership campaigns was a departure from the internal democratic procedure of the organization and was having a negative impact on the organization. Next paragraph, it was therefore with great disappointment to the IC when the president explained to the chairperson of the commission that since he was, this was a legal matter, he did not feel that it was right to discuss the CR campaign funds until the legal matters were finalized. The IC pursued the matter of the president, of meeting with the president and requested over an 18 month period to meet with the president several times, both verbally and in writing. It did not sit well with the IC that the presidents especially, but also the officials continually referred publicly to the importance of the IC and the work that was being done, but in reality had, but in reality there was little or no to no interaction. So firstly, the suggestion that he did so on his own volition, as confirmed by the NEC, is not is wholly inconsistent with the experience of the integrity committee itself. Secondly, whether um the CR-17 campaign was discussed and his conduct in regard thereto by the Integrity Commission. The answer to that is a no. And that answer is found in, in the first part of the Integrity Commission report. At paragraph one under integrity, under introduction, it reads, the ANC's integral 
Commission engaged with the ANC president, Comrade Matamela Cyril Ramaphosa, on 19 November 2020 via a Zoom video conference. The interview was at the request of the IC, with the main purpose of soliciting and exchanging views with the president on funding for campaigns for individuals seeking to hold office in the ANC. And in case, uh, we are not clear as to the purpose of that meeting, the report of which the first respondent relies. We need only have regard to paragraph six of the same report at page 003978. At the last paragraph of that page where it says, quote, the discussion was honest, frank and productive. Despite the purpose of the meeting, which was essentially to discuss the use of money for individual leadership campaigns, other issues were discussed as reflected above. To my, the answer then to uh, her ladyship is, if one has regard to the report relied upon, the integrity committee spent 18 months seeking audience with the first respondent to discuss in particular the issue of Busasa and the CR17 campaign funds. And it reflects, and the, the integrity's concern, the integrity commission's concern in this regard, that it was a departure and against, a departure from the procedures and values of the organization. What then happens seemingly, according to this report, is that that uh, is not done. And I must point out uh, and give credit to the first respondent because according to this report at paragraph three, it reads, whilst the president expressed the wish to deal with the CR17, its nature, organization and governance, the in integrity commission made it clear that in this meeting, the IC did not want to discuss the CR17 campaign. The long, the short, the long answer therefore, uh, Justice Winner, to the uh, decision of the integrity committee it's correct that the integrity committee didn't suggest that steps be taken against the first respondent. They, and, and we submit that. To understand correctly that they said they didn't want to deal with the CR17 at Indeed. that. So how is that, Audi? No, no, uh, it, I wasn't. Her ladyship had inquired whether yes. or the finding yes. of the CR17. Yes, I understand uh, that. Of the, sorry, integrity committee. So they made no finding, basically. They couldn't make a finding because they did not consider the issue. But then if they weren't considering the issue upon which he was suspended, how is that Audi? Be because the IC invited him to give him Audi. And when the meeting was, was to start and the first respondent presented himself so that he can be heard on this matter, by the IC itself, which is the body the resolution says must grant him Audi. The IC decided that it's not going to discuss that issue today. It is quite possible uh, that the IC may have discharged its obligations to give the first respondent Audi at another meeting. Whether that's or not, that's not, not whether your case, it, No, whether or not it did is irrelevant for our purposes right now, my lady, because the document that the first respondent puts up in substantiation of the allegation that the IC never made any adverse finding against him or recommended that steps be taken against him is inconsistent with, with, with what he wants it to say. That okay. IC report speaks to other issues. It is irrelevant. So, okay, so can we accept for the purposes of this argument that um, you rely on that meeting before the IC as the Audi that was given to him in order for the suspension to take place? It is the Audi before the IC, yes. Okay. Now, whether or not the, I, the IC, whether or not the IC did what it was supposed to do when the first respondent presented himself for the very purpose is a different issue. As one would say, perhaps the IC did uh, the first. Uh, Justice Mulate. Uh, sorry, we can't hear you, Justice Mulhedi. 
Um, yes, no, no, I just wanted to find out before you move on, who actually makes the decision to suspend? Is it the IC or... Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can, I can yes, hear you. Yes, we can hear you now. But now you've frozen. Um, Yes, let me let me let me see if I can um, contact our colleague. I'm just going to go on to mute for a second. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay, it seems that we may be back on now. Thank you. Judge Muller, Lehi, you were going to put a question to Ms. Sello. Are you, are you able to join us again? I think you unmute, you may need to unmute yourself. Yes. Okay. Are you battling the this? decision okay. to be done at the MEC or at the NW implemented by the Deputy Secretary General? I wanted I wanted if yeah, you could, perhaps repeat, me. could you repeat that question please because I think yes. not all Judge of us can, can you hear me? We can hear you now, but could you perhaps repeat the question because we, we may have missed parts of it. Okay. Okay. Mr. Lo, I was saying that uh, the question is who actually makes the decision to suspend? Because I think that's what will help us determine whether the Audi was granted or not. Who makes the decision to suspend, if I understand? Is, is yes. that the question? Okay. If, if that is the, the, the question, the SG makes yes. the, the SG makes the decision to suspend in terms of 2570. Now, the conference has given authority to summarily suspend people who fail to give an acceptable explanation or to voluntarily sus uh, step down. The conference has further directed that the ANC, and that the ANC in this sense, being a directive from the conference, shall be its structures, shall take decisive actions against all members involved in corruption, including those who use money to influence conference outcomes. So, in response, it is the SG and the appropriately uh, mandated structures of the ANC. Okay, Ms. Sello, can I, can I ask a follow-up question to that, please? Yes. Can you hear me? I think a, an important pillar of the applicant's case is the assertion that the ANC must act in accordance with its constitution, correct? Indeed so. And we also accept the principle that conference is the highest decision-making structure in the ANC, correct? Indeed. But would you accept as a matter of principle that whatever conference says must be done, 
must be in synergy with the constitution of the NC. No doubt. So, no doubt. so, so conference, notwithstanding um, its uh, position in the hierarchy of the ANC, may well, it may pass a resolution, but ultimately that resolution must be able to live within the constitution. If it cannot live within the constitution, then there's a difficulty. Correct. I accept that. So when, when conference says somebody must be suspended, one must then immediately go to the constitution Indeed and so. see whether there's a legal basis for that. Okay. Correct. Indeed and, so. And 25.70 will not provide a legal basis for anybody except if a jurisdictional requirement is met that they've been charged. Correct. Indeed so. Okay. So can there be reliance on 25.70 uh, with or without the conference resolution. Um, uh, let me, if 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 you permit me, I'll just backtrack. The constitution permits for suspension following certain procedures as um, as set out in Appendix Three of yes. the constitution. The constitution itself, however, allows for summary suspension pending certain procedures. So in the case of summary suspension, the requirements of Appendix 3 need not be met. Which provision provides for summary suspension? Um, no, the actual constitution. I will, yes. I will get them to open my constitution for me. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and, I, and I will cite the, 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 correct, the correct section. It's under... Uh, rule 25, but I need I need to locate okay. the actual rule okay. that permits for summary suspension. Now, okay. until, uh, as, as that rule is being located, may I then refer us to resolution three, which speaks to summary suspension. So that resolution, giving effect to that resolution, of course it is conditional upon a failure to voluntarily step aside or to fail to give an acceptable explanation. That, that then requires vo um, summary suspension. Now that is consistent with the constitution of the ANC. So the resolution does not offend the constitution of the ANC. But which provision of the constitution specifically says uh, you could suspend summarily? I, I'm, I'm sorry, Justice Mulakhe, you you are not very which, audible. Which, which, which provision of the Constitution provides for summary suspension? Uh, I, as I said, I'm trying to, to locate, if the court could bear with me two okay. minutes. Excuse me. Uh, 25.56 of the Constitution. It reads, the NEC, the NWC, PEC or PWC, as the case may be, may at any stage prior to the commencement of disciplinary proceedings against a member summarily dispend them, suspend the membership of that member in accordance with the provisions of this rule. But that's in contemplation of disciplinary proceedings, not so. That is in contemplation of disciplinary proceedings. If, if there are no disciplinary proceedings, does it trigger the power in 25.7? And secondly, uh, are you saying that summary, summary suspension can take place without Audi? And that would be consistent. Just give me that. For the, in answer to the first question, the, the, uh, my answer was to the question whether there is a power to summarily suspend, and there is. Now, whether or not this power must be exercised in anticipation only of disciplinary proceedings and that those disciplinary proceedings were not triggered or commenced with, that is a defense that ought to be raised by the respondents, which is not to be found on the record. So that, that is a, a, a different issue. Now, when we're talking about, we're talking here about the validity of the suspension. It may be that a summary, summary suspension may be invalid 
because disciplinary proceedings have not been initiated, could very well be. Uh, but that it was lawfully exercised in accordance with the resolution of the 54th conference is undeniable. So until it is law, can it, it is can, challenged. Can, can it be said it was lawfully exercised if it may be common cause that a, key, a clear jurisdictional fact that requires the exercise of that power was was missing, whether but raised the, whether raised or not. The, the, if uh, Justice Colopin, the exercise of that power, which is granted by the resolution of the 54th conference under three, must be read in the context of that resolution in in totality. The resolution requires anyone reported to have been involved in corrupt practices to give an explanation to the integrity committee or step aside. Okay. That's what it requires. And if they fail to do either, they may be su summarily suspended. Okay. Now we know in this instance that uh, the first respondent did not do either. He did not step aside and he did not give an explanation that can even be adjudged as to whether or not it's acceptable or not. Now as to why that happened, one may blame the integrity committee and its approach to the whole issue when the first respondent presented themselves. But the fact of the matter is, as things stand, the, uh, the first respondent has not placed any explanation before the integrity committee. So the two jurisdictional facts that are necessary for the invocation of that of those two resolutions have been met. Most importantly, uh, <clears throat> he does not deny that he did not give a satisfactory explanation to the integrity committee and we have in the replying affidavit pointed this out in the founding affidavit sorry we have pointed this out at paragraph 119.1 and that will be found at 00139 okay. if one has regard to the second the first respondent's affidavit that is not denied so the court should accept that there is no uh, reasonable explanation now, okay. Sorry, Mr. Um, I, I know I may be guilty of this as well, but um, we've obviously eaten into some of your time, and I see it's now ten to ten. So um, we're going to try and allow you to 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 finish. I mean, we can engage with you for the rest of the day, but I suppose there there would have to be a point where we ask you something, you give a response, and you know that's it and is what on. it is. It is what it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, mindful of the time as well. If if I if I may then just have regard to my notes because we've moved around quite a bit. Yes. I just want to check what it is I've already uh, addressed. Um, I I need to address the issue of that he <coughs> raises at his paragraph twelve, uh, thirteen rather of the answering affidavit where he says it was it was not clearly articulated why it was contended that he should be suspended. Um, he quotes the SG6, which is his suspension letter. And he says, he quotes the part where it reads, you have been reported to the serious officers directorate and the matter of sealed documents relating to your CR17 campaign prior and during the 54th National Conference is pending before our court. That, that is the basis. It is set out. So in part, at least the part that he quotes, so he cannot even on his own quotation suggest that it is not clearly articulated why he needed to be suspended. If what is stated in the letter is read in conjunction with the 54th conference resolutions together and take the entire suspension letter in its totality, then uh, that statement will be appreciated. I would like to invite us to SG6, which is the suspension letter. <coughs> And, and and that is at page 001, page 78. This letter, what, what, what the first respondent has quoted is actually the fourth paragraph of that letter. If one has regard to the letter, it refers in the first paragraph to the NEC and NWC's um, <clears throat> discussions regarding the need to implement the conference resolutions. At the second paragraph, it states, in particular, the 54th conference resolution on ANC credibility and integrity dealing with corruption. Now, that those resolutions are 
what we have quoted in our heads of argument at 00829, where it says the ANC should take decisive actions against people involved in corruption, including those who use money for conference. The third paragraph says, properly read and interpreted conference resolution in this regard provides that all cadres charged or reported to be involved in corrupt practice ought to step aside or be summarily suspended. Then it says, you have been reported to the serious offenses directorate. So, properly considered and applying the principles of endumene, it is incorrect for the first respondent to say that it, uh, the letter does not articulate the basis on which he ought to be suspended. It is right there in the first four paragraphs of the suspension letter. He chooses instead, for a reason best known to him, to rely on the report to the Serious Offences Directorate. But even so, let's assume for the moment that he is right. If one again goes back to the resolution, Resolution 2 under ANC Credibility and Integrity reads, demand that every CADA accused or reported to be involved in corrupt activities must, uh, if they fail to step aside and give an explanation, be summarily suspended. The, the, the referral to the Serious Offences Directorate means that the matter is under investigation. That is That complies with Resolution 3. It's an investigative procedure contemplated in Resolution 3. The investigation by the PP is carrying out an investigative exercise. That, again, is under investigation in accordance with uh, Resolution 3. We know that uh, there is a judgment which the first respondent relies upon between himself and uh, himself, our president of the country, and the PP. But we also know that that judgment is on appeal. So the matter has not been disposed of. The, in, the investigation is still live. Now, <clears throat> even if the public protector's case was disposed of in its entirety, the first respondent does not deny that this matter has been referred to the serious, to the serious offenses directorate involving amounts in the region, on, on the first respondent's uh, version, 300 million. He has said before the State Capture Commission that he's had the number 1 billion bandish about, but he's, at least he has confirmed 300 million. Um, in any language, that is equally significant. So when um, he notes that the matter has been referred to the serious Offenses Directorate, he doesn't come back and he said, I have, there is no such reference. I have been in contact with the Serious Offenses Directorate and they have no record of such. He notes it and then he goes completely silent about it. Now, he instead, as, as I said, <laughs> accepts and, and publicly de declares that he raised 300 million at the very least for purposes of the campaign. And this he did under oath before the State Capture Commission. Now to fully understand exactly what is happening and whether or not this conduct accords with the resolution, one must have regard to <clears throat> the very document that the first respondent puts up, which are the, present, the submissions he made to the public protector, and that is CR2 at page, starting at page 004490. And in particular, I would like to refer the court to page 508. At 508, uh, paragraph 40.4, under the heading fundraising, the following is recorded. The fundraising committee comprised of James Mutlazi, Donna Nicole, Sifiso de Bengua, and Crispian Olva. This committee was responsible for mobilizing funds and resources for the campaign and acted as trustees of the trust established for the campaign. It held that the final responsibility for the campaign budget and received reports on campaign expenditure. The importance of this committee is reflected at uh, paragraph 40.5 under organizing and campaigns, which states 
state, the purpose of this committee was to run mobilization and branch membership outreach programs in the first phases, establish and coordinate provincial and re regional organizing structures for the campaign and conduct political education and constituency work. Two things there. The mobilization uh, is of branch membership. This is involving the branches and using funds to do that and conducting uh, constituency work. That constituency work can only be carried out amongst the constituencies of the ANC. We then need to, having regard to that and understanding what on his own explanation was happening, we then have to have <laughs> regard to what he says in the pleadings. And this we will find at <clears throat> paragraph 19, of his answering affidavit. And in his answering affidavit, now I've, I've, I've paragraph 14, I apologize, 14 at 003473. And I would like the court to consider what he says in that paragraph in the context of what the very submissions on the of the CR 17 he made to the PP state. Sorry, what paragraph are you at? Paragraph? 1, 4, 14. Okay. That's the topic. At 003473. He starts, he, he takes issue with uh, the suspect, the, the issue, the, the quotation that he refers to from the um, suspension letter. And he says that it's an ill-informed distortion of the truth. The important part follows. He says the CR17 campaign was a campaign for the election of any members who stood as candidates that would constitute the leadership call that would make up the National Executive Committee that would lead the renewal process within the ANC at its 54th National Conference. On his own <laughs> admission, it was intended to, the campaign was, was directed and intended to influence the makeup of the NEC. Now, uh, it may very well be that there were other beneficiaries to that effort, but the, their, their issue is not before the court right now. At the very least, he is part of that cohort. And if regard is had to his very own admission and confession, and if one reads the res resolution H of the ANC that it, it shall constitute involvement in corruption to use money to influence conference S outcomes. So, so, sorry, the, the sorry, Ms. Seller, if I could um, <coughs> just just ask you, as a, as a matter of of principle, what what we are required to do, the yes. basis for the suspension is not a conclusion that there has been illegal activity. Correct. The basis for the suspension is that illegal activity has been reported. Correct. Now, the basis for the suspension is that you have offended the resolution mm. that say you may not raise money to influence the conference outcome. Yes, but it doesn't. It doesn't say you've done that. It says you've been reported to do that. Correct. It is. Let, it let's let's accept for the moment that the, it says so. Yes. But, so 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 what I'm simply asking is, surely it's not required of this court to make a determination on whether there was illegal conduct or not. Just as it's not required for us to make that determination in respect of the suspension, because the jurisdictional fact as you point out, is that if someone is the subject of an investigation, then that would trigger a suspension, the subject of an investigation. And, and uh, that's what the suspension letter says. You have been reported to have done this. Whether it was done or not, ultimately, would have to be determined by, by, by another body, another structure. All, all I'm saying is whether in this hearing we, we need to uh, have evidence that <coughs> tests the veracity of that submission. What uh, what is required is simply, if I look at the suspension letter, is that you have been reported to have done this. Judge Colopen, if I, I hope to be very brief in dealing with uh, with the question. Firstly, and and I, I keep referring us to our heads of argument because that's where they are succinctly captured. These resolutions, there are four resolutions at play. There's resolution two and three under the heading ANC credibility and integrity. And there's resolution HNR under fighting crime and corruption. These are four distinct resolutions that were adopted at the 54th conference. Now let's have regard to the suspension letter. 
The suspension letter refers to the resolutions of the <clears throat> of the 54th conference and at paragraph two says in particular the 54th conference resolution on ANC credibility and integrity dealing with corruption. It is these resolutions that are being referred to. Now, yes. when Judge Colopen makes reference to <coughs> investigative uh, or pro investigative procedures, that is one part, that is one resolution. A different resolution at H con uh, concerns the raising of money to influence conference outcomes. These are two separate charges. If one looks at SG6, it states, <clears throat> I, ap I apologize, I apologize, uh, Justice Colopin and, and judges. SG6, the suspension letter. Yes. First page, last paragraph states. Well, before, before, before we go to the last paragraph, can we look at the fourth paragraph first? Yes, I'm looking. You have been reported to the serious director. Yes. 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 Okay. And that would deal with the investigative procedure resolution. That is resolution three. All right. Okay. Now, if we go to the last paragraph of that letter, it reads, as stated above, it has been reported, Comrade President, that you and your Nazareth campaign team raised money in an attempt <laughs> to get branches to finally elect you as president of the ANC. That falls squarely within H of that resolution. Now, as if that is not enough, if even if uh, the court would, would hold that, that 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 case is not clearly made, that problem is resolved by this first respondent himself. At paragraph 14, he admits that I did so. The motive behind it is irrelevant for now, but that the <laughs> conduct as described by the first respondent himself at 14, squarely fall within resolution H? And the answer has got to be yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, I just... In uh, sorry, I think I think you've, you've muted yourself, Ms. Sello. Thank you. Th thank you, Judge Colopin. Uh, but by mistake, I definitely cannot afford to be muted right now um, because I need to deal with a very important aspect of the matter. And the, I, I would refer to our heads dealing with um, the other issues pertaining to the first respondent su suspension. Mm -hmm. um, as, I, as I indicated at the start of my submissions, that the, the first respond the applicant, the SG, invoke two powers there in, in suspending the first respondent. It is an instruction by the NWC, and it is the powers of the SG in terms of Rule 16.6.1 of the Constitution of the ANC. Not the first respondent, not the second respondent, challenges his powers in terms of 16.6.1. In fact, neither of the respondents even address themselves to that. Okay. The <clears throat> second respondent <clears throat> contends that the suspension by the SG of the first respondent was illegal. Now, and it's in his replying affidavit, the applicant consistent with the power that he claims in terms of 1661, annexes uh, FA, no, RA3. RA3 is a resolution of the 18th of January, 2018. Now we know that um, in the heads of argument, the respondents suggest that, that we, as regards this resolution, that they don't know whether that resolution is still in force, um, and basically put its validity into question, not seriously, but cast a cloud over it. However, we were prepared to deal with that until the respondents filed an opposition to Mr. Shazi's intervention. Uh, the, the, the court will recall that that intervention was 
Be, uh, part of the issues Mr. Shezi raised was challenging the authority of the second respondent, the Deputy Secretary General, to <coughs> represent the ANC in these proceedings. In defense of their position, they whipped up resolution, the resolution of 18 January 2018. And surprise, surprise, it is the same resolution that we call RA3 which in their heads they had suggested they don't know if it is valid, it is still valid or still applicable. So the court dealt with that resolution to some extent, in fact at length, in striking off Mr. Shazi's um, application. Now I would, like us, I would like to refer us to that resolution and I'll do that very, very quickly. That resolution is to be found <coughs> at page 00493, 00493. Yes. Annexure RA3. So now we know after filing their heads, they invoke the same resolution to challenge Mr. Shezi's uh, contention that Ms. Duarte is not duly authorized, and they succeed. That resolution at RA3 deals with two issues resolved. The first resolution was to mandate the SG and the DSG in their respective capacities as Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General to institute and, legal and, and defend legal proceedings on behalf of the ANC. But there is a second part to that. The second part to that st states, the second resolution, that the NEC delegates to the Secretary General and the national officials the power to take all reasonable to take all steps necessary or warranted for the due fulfillment of the aims and objectives of the ANC and the due performance of the ANC's duties and to provide reports to the ANC from time to time in this regard. So okay. uh, if this resolution must be read together with the ANC's constitution itself, and in particular, Rule 12 to 19. That is part of Rule 12, which deals with the powers of the NEC. Yes. Now, 12 to 19 empowers um, the NEC to delegate any of its powers, any, I emphasize, to the officials, the national officials, or secretary general. I think it's NWC. By, uh, yes, it's the NWC, comma, the officials or secretary general. In its wisdom, the, the ANC delegated to both the secretary general and the national officials. And we know that the Secretary General is also a national official. The second power they have is to take all steps necessary or warranted for the due fulfillment of the aims and objectives of the ANC and the due performance of its duties. What the, what the NEC did was to take the first power of delegation, marry it with the power they have to take steps necessary for the fulfillment of the objectives of the ANC and delegated the whole lot to the SG. So okay. we know that one of the objectives and aims of the ANC is to rid itself of all members who are accused of reported to be involved in corrupt practices, to rid itself of people who, when they fail to step aside or give an, an explanation, acceptable explanation while they face disciplinary, investigative, and prosecutorial procedures to be suspended, to take decisive actions, all members involved in corruption, including those who use money to influence conference. Yeah, all no. those powers and all those decisions have now been delegated to the okay. SG. And no, consistent with his powers as an SG, he okay. exercised the powers and as delegated to him. Okay, it is follow, on the basis... We, okay. we, follow, we follow that argument, Ms. Cello. I'm, I'm yes. just checking whether... You might be uh, reaching the conclusion of your of your argument. It's it's almost. I, I am. If I could just in, cover. In fairness, um, um, we've gone I half an hour over, and um, 
our interventions may may be less than half an hour. So I'm doing a fair sh a share of responsibility. OK, OK, I, I accept that and, and I, I do apologize to, to our learned friends. I, I'll just quickly then uh, turn my attention to the suspension. Uh, to the withdraw and apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that was the second leg of my, my argument. The withdraw and apologize um, letter from the NET is SG12. And um, if we have regard to SG12, that letter reflects the the view the views of the NEC. Now that letter is important uh, in the question whether or not the suspension is valid, accepting for the moment that in so doing the Secretary General was duly authorized both by the Constitution and the delegated power uh, to suspend the first respondent. Then we look at what the ANC, NEC considered at its meeting of the 8th to the 10th in reaching the decision that uh, it did. We say that the suspension is valid on two grounds. Firstly, the NEC in taking a contradictory position on this matter was um, and, and as to the validity of the action of the um, Secretary General was wrong, both in fact and in law. And second, the, pro the process that was <clears throat> undertaken was vitiated by the first respondent's participation therein. So it's on, on two levels. Firstly, if we had regard to SG12, SG12 quotes in the first paragraph, at the NEC meeting of 8, 10 May, uh, the NEC discussed your so-called letter of, of suspension dated 3rd May to, president, to the president, and it states the important part for which you had no authority or mandate from any structure of the movement. We know that's factually incorrect. And you've, you've dealt with that in support of the validity of the suspension. Indeed. Yes, so, okay. The second aspect is uh, that in taking that decision, the beneficiary of that deliberation and, and decision of the NEC, which is the first respondent, participated in, in that entire process, including a, a participation in issuing a sanction against the Secretary General. And that uh, sanction was publicly delivered or, or announced by the first respondent himself. In this <laughs> regard, this, this happened without any Audi to the first respondent, to the applicant, the SG. And while in that meeting where he could defend his position, and possibly draw attention to the NEC's own delegation, he was booted out of that meeting the before these discussions were held. The second issue is that having him booted out, the beneficiary of the debate, <laughs> the first respondent stays in the meeting. In the replying affidavit, we do make the point that it does not appear that at any point he was asked to recuse himself. He, it is assumed in his position as the president, took part in those deliberations and he sanctioned the <clears throat> decision that he withdraw and apologize. Now, we, as, as so, insofar as his own participation is concerned, we need to do no more than to refer to the very case uh, that the respondents rely upon which is the case of Mtimunye Bokoro. They do so in their heads of argument uh, at paragraph 73. And they say, uh, to raise the point that- Yemdam, are you on Mahashule today? Sorry, um, Beta, can we, can we ask everybody to please, uh, if you haven't been unmuted to, to please, um, I mean, you haven't been muted. To please mute yourself. We we need to have this hearing without any interference. Thank you. And um, th th thank you, Justice. Dr. Jonathan, can I suggest that the, the we, case we pause for a second? We we pause for a second and ask Peter to mute everybody, and okay. then we re um, uh, uh, unmute ourselves. 
Okay, will that be uh, fine? And Ms. Necessary, I've muted the person that was speaking. It's not a okay, problem. Sometimes you. it just takes a second because I have to scroll through the list of hundreds of attendees to see who's who's unmuted. But Thank you. And and then, Marcelo, could I give you five minutes to please wrap five up? Five minutes it is, and, and if not less, uh, Justice yes. Colopin. I had I I think I'm still audible. I don't yes. appear to be muted. Thank you. We refer on the Mutimunya case, uh, Mutimunya Bako, Bakoro. And, and, and in that case, it was held, held that a director facing suspension had a manifest conflict of interest in the deliberations of the suspension to be undertaken by the board and would be pre prevented from participating in such deliberations. Now, on, on the same principle that they, they, re, they invoke as to why the SG could not be involved in the issue of his own suspension in terms of SG, 20, in terms of Rule 2570, we say the same principle applies. The first respondent ought to have been recused from the deliberations regarding his suspension effected by the applicant and the validity thereof. But not only does he participate, he makes the announcement to declare his own innocence. Now, that is the that is the high the height of conflict of interest. So we we, we submit that in light of the fact that the NEC decision of the 8th of May was both factually and legally wrong because they ought to have known that uh, the SG was duly mandated. They are stopped from denying his authority. They delegated full authority to him and he exercised it. And secondly, on the basis that the entire process and proceedings were vitiated by the first respondent's participation in them, the purported suspension or the setting aside of the first respondent suspension is invalid. Where does that place us? It, it places us to, it restores the, restores the status quo ante prior to the 8th of May 2021. The suspension letter is there. What then must happen? What must happen is that it must be validly set aside. Now, in the interest of time, um, we will address in full the, the question of the validity and the failure of the first respondent in these proceedings to seek a relief in terms of which it asks for a declaration of invalidity of that suspension letter. We point out that it is not open to the court to meromotu declare that suspension invalid. The court must look at the submissions we make and the facts pleaded and not denied as to why we argue it is valid. In okay. the absence of a counter application, it must end. The rest we shall leave to uh, arguments in reply. These issues arise again in the course of the respondent's argument, so we shall address them in reply. Thank you, Justices, unless there are questions. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. 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 Sello. Um, Okay, um, it's 20 past 10 now. I think Mr. Mr. Trengrove has been having his calculator on and he's calculated uh, quite conscientiously the time that he's entitled to. Uh, whether he demands all of it is another matter, but let's hear what he has to say. Mr. Trengrove, thank you. Thank you very much, my lord, uh, my lady. Um, yes, I'll only say this took more than five hours, but I'll try and uh, devote less time to my submissions. I will address the topics <coughs> raised in our heads of argument in the sequence in which they are raised. That's the validity of Rule uh, 2570, the step aside rule and its implementation by the NEC, Mr. Magashula's suspension, the President's suspension, the request for a retraction and apology, the application to strike out. And lastly, say something about the suggestion that the president should have asked for condemnation. May I start with the validity of, of uh, Rule 2570? Now, this is an important chapter for two reasons. The first is because they ask specific relief in relation to the rule. They ask for the rule to be declared invalid. But it is also the rule under which Mr. Magashula acted when he suspended the president. So I will point out to you from time to time that there are extraordinary contradictions in Mr. Magashula's own case 
in that he purported to suspend the president under Rule 2570, but now contends for its invalidity and persists in both contentions, despite the fact that they are incompatible. We, we quote the rule in our heads of argument. Our heads of argument are in 008-68. Um, we quote the rule in our paragraph three, that's at 008-71. And I will frequently refer back to the rule, so I would like to just point to some of its features. The rule says where a public representative, office bearer or member has been indicted to appear in a court of law on any charge. So that's a jurisdictional prerequisite for the exercise of that power, is that the member must have been indicted to appear in a court of law on any charge. Now it's common cause that that doesn't apply to the president, but yet this rule was invoked against him. So that's the first requirement, that he's been indicted to appear in a court of law on any charge. The Secretary General or Provincial Secretary, acting on the authority of the NEC, the NWC, the PEC or the PWC at national level, this power may only be exercised on the authority of the NEC or the NWC. A second requirement, which this common cause is not satisfied in this case. I know Mr. Magashula claimed such authority, but on the facts, he just didn't have it. If satisfied that the temporary suspension of such public representative, office bearer or member would be in the best interest of the organization. That is very important because that captures the purpose of this power. It is not a dis, um, it is not a disciplinary power. It is not a punitive power. It is a power designed to protect the best interests of the organization. And then it says, if the SG forms that view, that it's in the best interests of the organization, then he may suspend. So the purpose is to protect the organization. And the rationale for it is obvious. No organization of any self-respect wants somebody indicted on a serious crime to be its public face, to be seen to be in its leadership. Which party can, with any credibility, tell the electorate that it is fighting the scourge of corruption while one of its senior leaders stands indicted on very serious charges of corruption? That is the purpose of the rule. It is to protect the party and to protect the best interests of the party. It is not a disciplinary rule as has been suggested. Now, the attack on this rule was very cryptically pleaded. There was nothing of these, all these fancy arguments that my learned friend Mr. Mpofu raised. The pleading was, we quoted in our paragraph four, that the clause was out of sync with the provisions of the Constitution and the ANC Constitution, and I quote, more particularly as it violates both rules of natural justice and more importantly, the presumption of innocence. So that, that was a twofold attack, and that was all. Firstly, that it violates the rules of natural justice, and secondly, that it violates the presumption of innocence. That was the only attack on, on the rule. And none of this argument that we were entertained on yesterday was advanced at all. Now, I don't need to tell you that a litigant is held to its causes of action pleaded in its founding affidavit. You can't change horses and shift ground. Every time you discover that your cause of action is bad, shift to another. And we will see that there has, in this case, been many a shift. Every time Mr. Magashula finds himself on floundering legal foundation, he shifts ground. And even an argument we heard this morning, we heard a few minutes ago, that Mr. Magashula apparently suspended the president under Rule 1661. Well, that's the first time we've heard of it and I'll get back to it. But it's another illustration 
of how Mr. Margashula, every time he runs into problems, then he shifts ground. He's not allowed to do so. But on this attack that the um, rule violates the principles of natural justice, it's important to have regard to the jockey club line of cases, the cases that govern voluntary associations, because what they make plain is this, that we, that voluntary associations constitution is a contract between the association and its members, and where it, where it confers disciplinary powers on the voluntary association, then an implication arises that it will exercise those powers in accordance with my day, we were taught of the rules of natural justice, more modern times speak of the fundamental principles of justice. But it is an implication which arises unless the country is stated in the, in the constitution. So if needs be, if this is a, if, if we're wrong in every submission that we make, if our learned friends are correct, and this is a disciplinary uh, provision, and no provision is made, no express provision is made for the application of the rules of natural justice, then under the jockey club line of cases, that, implica that um, requirement arises by implication. So that even if this is a disciplinary provision um, and no express provision is made for the application of the rules of natural justice, under the jockey club line of cases, that implication arises uh, tacitly. And therefore, you can't condemn the clause for being in violation of the principles of natural justice simply because natural justice isn't expressly provided for. That is, every jockey club's constitution provides for disciplinary powers, no express provision for natural justice, but the courts have long held, for a century held, that that is implied. Then our learned friends also now rely on section 19 of the constitution. Not an attack pleaded, by the way, and therefore not a permissible one. But let me face it, even if they were allowed to invoke it, the fact of the matter is that the Constitution, Section 19 of the Constitution, does not mean that a political party may never suspend a member, does not mean that a political party may never expel a member. And um, our learned friend ultimately had to accept that what it means is no more than to require of a political party, if it impinges upon the freedom of a member to participate in its activities, that it must do so in accordance with the rules of natural justice. And that really is the heart of Ramakatsa paragraph 73, which um, the court is certainly aware of, and Lady Justice Wiener has referred to it, where the Constitutional Court said the following. Section 19 of the Constitution does not spell out how members of a political party should exercise the right to participate in the activities of their party. For good reason, this is left to political parties themselves to regulate. These activities are internal matters of each political party. Therefore, it is these parties who are best placed to determine how members would participate in internal activities. The constitutions of political parties are the instruments which facilitate and regulate participation by members in the activities of a political party. So, the, the section 19 has a perfectly sensible interpretation a la Ramakatsa, and that is <clears throat> that Everybody, every citizen has a constitutional right to join a political party and to participate in its, in its activities. And nobody may um, preclude any, any citizen from doing so. 
But when they do participate, they participate in accordance with the rules of the party. And the section, the constitution doesn't say that you have a right to participate free of any discipline and free of any restriction. On the contrary, the constitutional court says that the manner of participation <clears throat> is regulated by the constitution. Now, my learned friend ultimately accepted that proposition, and he ultimately accepted that the section, the implication of the section is no more than to require Audi when you um, uh, suspend a member. But let me just reinforce that concession that he made, because it is really one that must be obvious. The extreme position that he started off with was pointed out to him would mean that a political party may never suspend a member. He accepted that that could never be the implication. It would, in fact, go further. It would never allow a political party to discipline a member either by suspension or by expulsion. In fact, if, if the constitution means that you can't prescribe to members how to participate in the activities of political parties, then the section must also mean that you can never, you can never discipline a member for the member's conduct in the participation in, of the activities of a political party. A member would be allowed, for instance, publicly to repudiate the party and to uh, defy its discipline because the constitution says you can decide how to participate in the affairs of a political party. Now, that clearly is not so. My learned friend has accepted that that is not so. And he accepts, in fact, that that would be absurd. And his bottom line, therefore, is that it requires no more than Audi. Well, if that is so, then the Section 19 can't um, imperil the constitutional validity of Rule 2570, because all that means then, all that the Constitution requires of Rule 2570 is that that power be exercised in accordance with the principles of natural justice. Well, that's what the Jockey Club cases tell us is implied when you have a disciplinary power. We shall later submit to you that the exercise of this power is subject to the requirements of natural justice, but it remains to ask oneself what natural justice requires in this case. We know that if, um, well, let me, let me address it later, but let me, let me immediately say, so the only remaining question is <clears throat> what natural justice requires of the exercise of this power. But whatever that requirement might be, it doesn't imperil the validity of the rule. At the moment, I'm addressing the validity of the rule. My learned friend's bottom line is that all the Constitution requires of the rule is that it permits the rules of natural justice to apply. My, our answer is, under the Jockey Club line of cases, natural justice is impliedly applicable and therefore there is no ground of invalidity. There is a further ground as well, and that is section 39.2 of the Constitution. If he says that that is what section 19 of the Constitution requires, that this power be exercised um, in accordance with the rules of fundamental justice, well then section 39.2 of the Constitution would also require you to interpret the common law to mean to have to bear, to bear that meaning. In other words, for the common law to require in these circumstances that a power of that kind be exercised in accordance with the rules of natural justice. So whether you do it on a jockey club implied contract basis or on a section 39.2 interpretation, both routes get you to the same outcome, and that is that the rules of natural justice govern the exercise of this power. All that remains for us to, be, to determine is what the rules of natural justice require in a case like this and whether those requirements have been met. Sorry, but, Mr. Trindle, uh, just while, while you're on that point, um, it was argued that the... Um, sorry, Judge Collipin, if I can just say, I think we may have lost Judge 
Mughaleli. So I just thought maybe oh. we should check that out before continuing. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Gosh, I'll just check. I did see that he's not on screen, but he has been in the proceedings. So I'm just going to double check now again. Okay. I'll I'll check with him as well. He is here, Judge, in in the list of participants. Okay, our colleague Judge Mulcahy is with us. Um, he can't be seen, but he can be heard. So uh, that's right. what that, that's right. what matters. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Trendle. I was just going to ask you, uh, uh, at that point: is it was it was suggested that the effect of twenty five point seventy constitutes a limitation of the rights in nineteen, and therefore that triggers uh, the the limitation inquiry in in section thirty six. Uh, what's your view on that? Well, to, to conclude that it's a limitation, one first has to determine what the Constitution requires. In other words, what the implication is, what Section 19 requires. You can't uh, come to any conclusion about the limitation of a right until you have defined the, the requirements of that right. Now, and that is where one has to ask yourself, what does Rule 19 require? What does uh, Section 19 require? And it is on that point where, where Ramakatsa paragraph 73 is decisive because it makes it clear that all that, Ramak all that uh, um, Section 19 requires is that you allow all citizens a freedom of choice to participate in the activities of a political party. But the manner in which they are allowed to participate is something that falls beyond the scope of Section 19. That is regulated by the constitution of the political party. So, if you ask yourself, what is the, what are the contours, what are the boundaries and the requirements of this constitutional right? Then it is a right to join and participate in the activities of a political party in accordance with its constitution. Well, then in this case, there is absolutely no limitation of the right because the uh, member who is disciplined or who is suspended or who is expelled is not precluded from participation in the political party in accordance with the provisions of its constitution. So the answer to that contention is once there is a limitation, yes, then you have to go to section 36 to see whether the limitation is justified. But in, a case where you, but in a case where you don't even get to a limitation, where the constitution requires no more than the constitution already affords every member who joined the party, then there is no limitation. And then there is no section 36 inquiry because section 36 inquiry is only triggered if somebody impinges on a right, on a constitutional right. So if you ask yourself, does a rule that permits suspension limit the right under section 19? Then the answer is no, because the right under section 19 is the right to join and participate in the activities of the political party but in accordance with its constitution. There is no right never to be suspended or never to be disciplined or never to be expelled. Those matters are matters um, about which the constitution leaves the jurisdiction to the political party to express in its constitution. The only other basis on which 
Mr. Marushula attacked the validity of Rule 2570 is that it was said to be in violation of the presumption of innocence. Now, the presumption of innocence as it was pleaded is the constitutional right of presumption of innocence, and it was suggested that the suspension right violates the presumption of innocence because the presumption of innocence would have it that somebody accused of a crime must be deemed to be innocent. But that, with respect, is a misguided understanding of the presumption of innocence. The presumption of innocence is a constitutional right, but it is a, a, a right entrenched in Section 35.3H. Section 35.3 is a right or a collection of rights conferred on an accused person. In other words, the Section 35.3H, read with its preamble, reads as follows. Every accused person has a right to a fair trial, which includes the right to be presumed innocent, to remain silent, and not to testify during proceedings. So it is a right which governs the manner in which criminal prosecutions are conducted. It has nothing whatsoever to do with uh, the conduct of disciplinary or civil litigation in any way. And in fact, it's such a, a trite proposition that it's hard to find authority for it. But the Constitutional Court does did make it plain in a case which we didn't mention in our heads of argument, but if we may add it, it's a case of Prince Lua v. van der Linde, 1997, Volume 3, SA, 1012, Judgment of the Constitutional Court and the applicable paragraphs are 37 and 38. What was an issue there was a civil onus that was created in the case of felt fires uh, against the landowner on whose land a felt fire originates. And the question was whether that rebuttable onus was unconstitutional because it was in conflict with the presumption of innocence. And the Constitutional Court held no, the presumption of innocence operates uh, in the conduct of criminal prosecutions and not in the conduct of civil litigation. The crucial, crucial sentence is in paragraph 38 where it says, there is indeed nothing rigid or unchanging in relation to the question of the incidence of the onus of proof in civil matters. No established golden thread like the presumption of innocence that runs through criminal cases. So it makes it plain that the presumption of innocence is confined to the conduct of criminal cases and does not apply in the case. This is not even civil litigation. This is. Um, disciplinary proceedings of the civil nature. So we submit with respect that as for the first attack, the attack on the rule, that there is absolutely no basis for it, that the high water mark of the attack is that the constitution might require the rule to be subject to the rules of natural justice. Well, if there is such a requirement, then it is implied and therefore uh, the fact that it's not spelled out that is not the validity of the rule at all. May I then turn to the second topic, and that is the step aside rule. Because um, the main plank of Mr. Magashula's attack was that the NEC had not given valid effect to the step aside rule because it had narrowed down the rule. Now, and the essence, the essential contention there is that the um, step aside rule under the uh, conference resolutions was a broad rule and the NEC has unlawfully narrowed it down. Now, we will, and, and let me say, that argument as to what was the, 
what did the conference resolutions require on the one hand, and how has it been narrowed down on the other? That argument has also shifted ground, and I will address it. But let me make it, uh, tell you where we are heading in this chapter, and that is this. Our first submission shall be that the NEC didn't narrow down anything, that it gave full and proper effect, that its guidelines give full and proper effect to the conference resolution. So that the starting premise of Mr. Magushula's attack, that the NEC narrowed down the conference resolution, it's simply not correct. It's not correct on the facts. But there is an alternative uh, submission that we make that seems to us in any event to be fatal to Mr. Magashula's uh, attack. And that is that <clears throat> even if the NEC had narrowed down the conference resolution, then it, it is, its guidelines are still valid as far as they go. Because nobody has suggested that the guidelines had um, go beyond the perimeters or beyond the scope of the conference resolutions. The, the, the complaint is that the conference resolutions have been narrowed down, that the guidelines don't give full effect to the conference resolutions. Well, even if that is true, which we deny it is, but even if that is true, then the implication is simply that the NEC guidelines do not give full effect to the conference resolution, but that they are valid as far as they go. There's nothing to invalidate them. Assume for the moment the conference resolutions required 100 things to be done. The NEC resolutions do 80 of them, but has omitted to do the last 20. Well, then the 80 would still be valid as far as they go. There is nothing <coughs> invalid to them <coughs> because what Mr. Magashula accepts is that they give effect to the conference resolutions as far as they go. His only attack is that they don't go far enough. So it seems to us that this is a futile attack because even in its own terms does not invalidate the uh, NEC's guidelines. Mm. Yeah. Now, you will know that the conference resolution uh, adopted a series of uh, of resolutions, four resolutions. Sorry, before. Mr. Trengrove, can I can I ask you this question, please? Because uh, it was a significant part of the argument we heard yesterday. If the if the NEC um, resolution and the subsequent action don't go as far as conference had indicated. Uh, and, and I know that's not a concession made, but you're saying alternatively if that is so. Uh, and if there isn't a valid reason why it doesn't go as far as it was required to go, then can it be said that that it has gone so far and no further remains valid and is not subject to attack? Or does the fact that it hasn't given effect to the resolution in its entirety because the resolution it's in, in its entirety appears to want to deal with a particular type of conduct in its entirety without necessarily de uh, desegregating degrees of culpability and liability and therefore it may well be open to being tainted to that extent because it uh, it may constitute a selective approach to dealing with a broad problem that the conference has identified. No, with respect, not. If the, if the conference resolution, let me crudify it just to make it simpler. If the conference resolution says that you must apply the step aside rule in relation to misconduct uh, of a kind one to ten, and now the guidelines come and they apply the step aside rule to misconduct items one to eight, then there's absolutely nothing uh, uh, unlawful as far as it goes. I'm not suggesting then that the, that the NEC is not open to a remedy, but the remedy, if there is one, would then be to tell the NEC to fulfill the mandate not for 80%, but for 100%. Nobody has suggested that 
what it has done thus far is in any way out of keeping with the conference resolution. The only complaint has been that it doesn't go far enough. And if that is the only complaint, well, then the guidelines can't be said to be uh, unlawful or not in accordance with the conference resolution. They are as far as they go. But let me, well, let me come back to the first leg, and that is to submit to you that the uh, conference, that the uh, NEC guidelines give full and proper effect to the conference resolution. Now we tell the history <coughs> of the, uh, from the conference resolution through to the adoption of guidelines in um, uh, early 2020 in our heads of argument, and you are acquainted with those with that history. I'm not going to take you through it. Um, the important point of the history, though, um, and we would emphasize this, is that the authors of the guidelines have consistently uh, intended to give full and proper effect to the guidelines. If you look through all of those NEC resolutions, the president's um, political overview, his um, um, letter to the NEC resolutions, the NEC mandate to the to the officials to prepare the guidelines. Everybody along the line had always in, intended, in good faith, to give full and proper effect to the guidelines. So um, you must accept, because there is no evidence to the contrary, that the guidelines were a good faith attempt by the NEC acting on the advice of the senior officials to devise guidelines which give full effect to the conference resolutions. And then what we ultimately so do. Can I just can I just ask a question, Mr. Pringer? Um, the argument seems also to stem from the fact that um, the applicant argues that the NEC can't override or amend the resolutions of the conference. What, what's your no, response uh, to that? I, I would accept that the NEC cannot override the, uh, the conference because the conference is the highest authority in the party. And therefore, we accept as a basic premise that the NEC may not contradict the, uh, the conference resolution. And ultimately, we also accept that the NEC must fulfill the conference mandate, i.e. to apply the step-aside rule in accordance with the conference resolutions. We say it did so, but we also say, but even if it did, its shortcoming was confined to a failure at worst to give full effect to the conference resolution. And the, that failure doesn't render invalid what it has done. It merely requires the NEC to supplement what it has done. But let me start with the first proposition because we do want to uh, make it plain that you shouldn't understand us in any way to conceive that the guidelines of the NEC do not give full and proper effect to the conference resolution. And here again, we, we are, have um, this difficulty that Mr. Magashula shifted ground. His initial complaint was that the guidelines failed to give full and proper effect to the, to the conference resolutions because the conference resolutions were not confined to people indicted uh, of criminal offences, the conference resolution also uh, extended to people accused of corruption, even though they had not been indicted. That was the that was the basis of his attack in his uh, in his founding affidavit. And you will remember that he says that the um, NEC guidelines have departed from the mandate of the of the conference because it has now made the NPA the arbiter of who should be suspended or not. 
But that attack was based on a, uh, on a blind reading of the guidelines. That attack simply did not recognize that the guidelines created two categories of people to whom it applies the step aside rule. And for good reason. The first category is those who have been indicted. And the second category is those who are accused but have not been indicted. And it is a sensible distinction to make because in the case of those who have been indicted, one knows that uh, someone is indicted only if the NPA have done an investigation, the NPA is satisfied that there is a prima facie case, and the NPA then triggers a criminal prosecution, which is a formal process by which the validity of the accusations will be determined. So it is sensible to deal with people who have been indicted as a separate category. Another category, which it deals with at some length, is people who are accused of Sorry, can we? Can you just refer us to the guidelines in the yes, case certainly. line so that we can have a look at them? Certainly. They are at 003 uh, 327. <laughs> um, You will see that it, it uh, starts off, off at 327 by reciting the conference resolutions. In other words, that it clearly it recited the conference resolutions and it also attached copies of the conference resolutions. So it is an avowed attempt to give effect to the conference resolutions. But then at 328 in paragraph 3, it starts off with the guidelines for implementing the national conference resolutions. It then goes over the page in 329, stepping aside following indictment to appear in a court of law. And it sets out and it elaborates on those rules in 3.1.1 through 3.1.11. And look at the last paragraph, 3.1.11. Well, point 10, where a member, office bearer or public representative, this is now somebody who's been indicted, refuses to step aside, notwithstanding the decision of the NEC or PSC that he should do so, the organization shall invoke rule 2570. And then it uh, tells us what 2570 says. So that is a procedure designed for people who have been indicted, um, but refuse to step aside. And then it provides for temporary suspension under 3.1. And it elaborates in 3.2.1 and 3.2.2 um, on that same category of people who have been indicted but refused to step aside. Um, at 3.3.1, it creates a different category or provides for an additional process whereby temporary suspension pending ANC disciplinary processes following an indictment. So you might also, where there is an indictment, you may also decide to have an, uh, a disciplinary process, and in that event it's governed by 3.3. And then 3.4 at page 3.3.2 deals with the other category, and that is members facing allegations of corruption and or serious crimes. That is to be people who face allegations but have not been indicted. Now, in that category, it is important that you create a mechanism, as they do here, to call people to account, to assess their explanations, and then to decide what to do with them. So, in 342, you will see that they provide for the Integrity Commission to consider the accusations against them. Over on page 334 and paragraphs 3422, the IC, the Integrity Commission takes a decision. And then in 34222, the appropriate structures act on the recommendation of the IC 
and that is further elaborated on in the following page, 335, where uh, in, in paragraph 343, it speaks of the processing of the recommendations of the IC. So it draws a, a sensible distinction between those who have been indicted and those who have not been indicted, but stand accused, but cover both, and that's the important point. And then just uh, while we're here at 336, you would see that there is a, a an annexure of the very conference resolutions we're talking about, and that reinforces my submission to you that this was a good faith attempt to give effect to this resolution. Now, sorry, Mr. Trengrove, could I could I check with you? Um, do the guidelines uh, create room for anybody who's the subject of an investigative? Of process in in your view is it yes. able to be interpreted in that way oh yes certainly because it provides for anybody who stands accused of, that would be the last the last category yes yes so that is a broad category which provides for every form of accusation um, of anybody who's not been indicted it's a catch-all category for which catches everybody who stands accused of corruption or fraud or whatever the various crimes uh, but who has not been indicted. So it covers the field entirely. So that, with respect, Mr. Mr. Marakula's initial attack on the uh, on the guidelines that they fall short of the conference resolution because they are confined to people who are indicted and do not extend to people who are accused but not indicted. That attack is unfounded. Just, just to uh, complete my question, Mr. Mr. Trengrove, to the extent that the conference resolution grouped people who were the subject of disciplinary, investigative, and prosecutorial procedures as worthy of the same treatment, which was suspension, but the guidelines do it differently, um, yes. is that not the case? No, with respect, the, the guidelines do not um, in any way insulate those people from suspension. It merely recognizes that where someone has been accused, but there's no criminal process underway to determine whether that accusation is justified, then you need another process to assess the accusation to determine whether it is appropriate to uh, suspend these people and perhaps take disciplinary steps against them. So it draws the distinction not because it's aimed at a different outcome, but simply because it recognizes that you have a criminal process underway on the one hand, and you don't have it underway on the other. And therefore, on the other, where you cater for all other forms of accusation, you have to have a process to sift and consider and evaluate accusations before you suspend them but that it may ultimately, on the recommendation of the Integrity Commission, result in a, a suspension. Yes, certainly, that is so. But you know, the conference resolution, um, well, I'll get to them shortly. The conference resolutions uh, were in very loose, uh, in principle, language. And you can't attach um, focused attention to any little phrase in the conference resolution. One has to read them together in order to um, in, in order to understand what they had in mind. Because Mr. Magashula has now shifted ground again. He now recognizes that the guidelines are not limited to people who have been indicted. They are also aimed at people who stand accused in whatever form. And therefore, his original attack made in his founding affidavit is invalid. So what does he now do? He now argues that the guidelines are invalid because they fail to give proper effect to resolution H. Now, if I may ask you to go to the, the conference resolutions, who, which are quoted in our heads of argument at 008-88, that's paragraph 34 of our heads of argument. <coughs> yeah. 
you will see that these resolutions are formulated as conference resolutions would. And that is in layman's language, um, where the same idea is expressed four times, never in precisely the same way, but there's clearly no intention to formulate a rule. The purpose of the conference resolution is merely to articulate a principle and then to leave it to the NEC to give effect to the principle. But <clears throat> if you look at um, paragraph two, demand that every cadre accused of or reported to be involved in corrupt practices accounts to the integrity committee immediately or face DC processes. Three, summarily suspend people who fail to give an acceptable explanation. Acceptable to whom? Or voluntarily step down while they face disciplinary investigative or prosecutorial procedures for what? It doesn't say what for. ANC should take decisive action against all members involved in corruption, <clears throat> including those who use money to influence conference outcomes. Now, this is the one on which Mr. Magashula now fixates. And he says that the guidelines do not give effect to this resolution. But you must understand this resolution. Remember, all four resolutions were adopted in the context of a conference which decided a watershed decision of a conference that decided actively to set its face against the scourge of corruption and to um, mandate the NEC to take positive steps to do so. So this is, these are all four resolutions, resolutions adopted in the context of declaring war on corruption. So when you read the four resolutions together, then that's absolutely apparent, even though there are little differences between them. But then when you read H, you should read the whole of H, not uh, merely a a part of H. In the context of that big war on corruption resolution, it reads as follows. ANC should take decisive action against all members involved in corruption. That's the main um, the operative part of the sentence. Must take action, decisive action against all members involved in corruption, including those who use money to influence conference outcomes. That's not a separate category. That is people who use corrupt means, use money corruptly to influence conference outcome. That's vote buying. That is not aimed at a member of the ANC who hires a hall for a campaign meeting or who hires a uh, a uh, stadium for a rally, for a campaign rally. This is aimed at corruption, and that is the corrupt use of money to influence conference outcomes. That's vote buying. That's what that is about. So that to read only the last part as if it stands uh, uh, unqualified by the first part is with respect a blind reading. This is directed at corruption and at the corrupt influencing of the outcomes of, of elections. So even on that score, the Mr. Magashula's interpretation, his second unpleaded attack is equally unfounded because it is based on a um, um, unduly blinkered interpretation of that clause, which like the others, is in the first place directed against corruption. So that we submit with respect that the guidelines give full and proper effect to the conference resolution. And if anybody complains that it doesn't go far enough, that there is still a loophole somewhere, then let them come to court and demand that that loophole be closed. The NEC would, I'm sure, be the first to welcome uh, any suggestion that it might have left some part of the corruption field uncovered. But it didn't, certainly didn't intend to do so, and we submit with respect that it didn't do so. 
it caters for all people who stand accused of corruption, whether indicted or not. And all of them face the prospect of ending up in, um, in suspension. So that uh, the, um, the suggestion that the NEC left some part of the field uncovered is just not correct. Let me also say uh, what I forgot to mention is that another good reason for this distinction between indicted and unindicted accused is that in the case of the indicted accused, the party has the constitutional remedy of 2570 available to it um, because it specifically caters for the suspension of indicted people but it doesn't cater for the suspension of unindicted people. And therefore, that is another reason, apart beyond the reasons I have suggested, that is another reason why it was sensible for the NEC to draw a distinction between indicted and unindicted people. Mr. Trendle, I'm not sure, are you, are you planning to move to your third point? I am at this moment, yes. I, I wondered, we've been, we've been at it since nine o'clock, would this be um, an appropriate time just to take a short comfort break, about 10 minutes. Certainly, I'll be back. Okay. Good, thank you. 25 past. Uh, court will adjourn for 10 minutes. Thank you.
if everybody's back, we can we can start. Thank you, Mr. Tengo. Thank you very much, uh, my lord. Is um, Judge Juan, Judge Juana is with us? Is she? I don't see her. Yes, but, uh, yes she is. Here I am. Okay. I'm turning now to the third chapter, and that is Mr. Magashula's suspension. We address it in our heads of argument from page 008-93 from paragraph 45. Mr. Magashula contends that his suspension was invalid for on four grounds. The first is that he was not afforded a fair hearing before his suspension. The second is that his suspension was in breach of his right under section 19 of the constitution. Um, the third is that the DSG, Ms. Duarte, was not authorized to issue his letter of suspension because that's an authority vested only in the Secretary General. And the, th the fourth is that his suspension was in breach of some of these uh, specific requirements of Rule 2517. Now, let me say that those first two grounds, that he was not afforded a uh, fair hearing before his suspension, and that his suspension was in breach of his rights under Section 19, they have now collapsed into a single complaint because my learned friend accepted that Section 19 merely required that he be given a fair hearing. So those two complaints really now have collapsed into one. And the question is whether he was entitled to a fair hearing, and if he was, whether he got one. Now, I we accept that Section 20, uh, Rule 2570 is subject to a jockey club implication, and that is an implied term, that it is subject to the application of the rules of fundamental fairness. But the question then is, what does fundamental fairness require in the context of the suspension of a member who has been indicted on a crime under Rule 2570? We will submit in the first place that such a member who is being suspended under 2570 uh, is not entitled to a hearing because the rules of uh, Natural justice do not require that such a person be given a hearing, and we will invoke constitutional court authority for that proposition. But let me also make it clear that we will submit that even if he was entitled to a, a fair hearing, that he got one, that he got an ample hearing, um, far beyond the requirements of Ariat and Patim, so that he really fails on two different grounds. The first is, was he entitled to a, a fair hearing? Now, remember, I've said we accept that the rules of fundamental fairness apply to the exercise of the power under 2570. The question is whether fundamental fairness requires that he be afforded a hearing. Now, in that, on that score, the constitutional court judgment we submit in Long's case it's a judgment we mention in paragraph 49 of our heads, that that judgment is decisive of that issue, this issue because the Constitutional Court overturned earlier jurisprudence, which held that an employee is entitled to a fair hearing before being suspended pending the outcome of disciplinary proceedings. And the Constitutional Court held in long that that is not so. And I, if I, we quote the ratio at the foot of our page 27 in paragraph 49, where it said the Constitutional Court said, in respect of the merits, the Labor Court's finding that an employer is not required to give an employee an opportunity to make representations prior to precautionary suspension cannot be faulted. As the Labor Court correctly stated, the suspension imposed on the applicant was a precautionary measure, not a disciplinary one. This is supported by Mohale, Mashejo, and Gradwell. 
Consequently, the requirements relating to fair disciplinary action under the LRA cannot find application. Where the suspension is precautionary and not punitive, there is no requirement to afford the employee an opportunity to make representations. Now, let me just make it quite clear. We're not suggesting that Mr. Um, Mahashula's suspension was a suspension subject to the fairness requirements of the Labor Relations Act for purposes of this case. If he were interested in invoking and enforcing his um, rights under the Labor Relations Act, he would have had to go to the, to the Labor Court, which he didn't do. So we're not suggesting that the LRA governs this inquiry. But what the, why the analogy is a good one is that the LRA also requires fairness, fair labor practice. So the long judgment is good authority for the requirements of fairness in the case of a precautionary suspension of an employee. And it said because the suspension is precautionary and not disciplinary, therefore no hearing is required. And we submit for the same reasons in our case. Our case, the purpose of the suspension is to protect the interests of the organization and is not punitive or disciplinary. And therefore, uh, that a hearing is also not required. Sorry, Mr. Twengo, can I can I ask you this? Um, the long judgment is is not a is not a long judgment in in the sense of um, it, it it deals crisply with the point you raise, yeah. and and what it does is it says what is not required. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say what is required in order to meet the bar of uh, fundamental fairness and. If, if, if you proceed on the basis that fundamental fairness is required, then long is only helpful to the extent as to what it excludes, not as to what may be warranted by meeting the bar of fundamental fairness. And what is your view, uh, having accepted that fundamental fairness is a, is a bar to meet, would be required to meet that bar? Let me, let me say this. We submit that uh, Audi is not required at all, and I accept that that is as far as long goes. But I also submit that um, long goes all the way to refute Mr. Magashula's complaint, because his complaint is Audi is required, long says Audi is not required. I appreciate that I haven't yet answered your question. But long is a complete answer to Mr. Magashula's complaint. If you ask me what fairness required, well, fairness would, I would thought, at least require um, a serious consideration of the evidence in a good faith attempt to determine whether it is necessary and appropriate to suspend in order to achieve the purpose of the suspension. In other words, a test of uh, a reasonable assessment of the a good faith assessment of the available evidence and consideration of, of the question more important, whether suspension is necessary to achieve its purpose. But what it doesn't do is to require you to hear the suspended member. And that is what Long says. And, and that is so particularly because um, the purpose of Rules 2570 is to protect the organization. And you remember all ANC members uh, make a declaration in which they um, pledge to always uphold the interests of the organization above their own. This rule uh, therefore allows the organization where it is deemed in good faith to be necessary to do so, to suspend a member in the interest of the organization. Um, if, if you were, however, to hold that a fair hearing is required, despite Long's case, then we submit with respect that Mr. Magashula received uh, 
um, ample hearing. And we start off by asking a question related to the one that um, you raised, my lord, and that is what does a fair hearing entail? Uh, what does fairness entail? Well, we cite Professor Hookster in our paragraph 51, where she makes it clear that procedural fairness in the form of Audi Altem Patum is concerned with giving people an opportunity to participate in the decision that will affect them, and crucially, a chance of influencing the outcome of those decisions. And then over the page, she makes it clear that it's a highly via variable requirement. Fairness is a highly variable concept in South African law. What makes a hearing fair has always depended on the circumstances, and that holds true today. Our courts readily accept that fairness is not something that can be reduced to a one-size-fits-all formula. While placing emphasis on fundamentals, such as notice of threatened action and an opportunity to make representations to the relevant administrator, they have refused to lay down rules concerning the content of fairness. And that um, same approach was recently endorsed by the um, Supreme Court of Appeal by one of our judges renowned for his administrative law expertise, namely Justice Plaskett, in a case of ESO, that's E-S-A-U, ESO v. Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, 2021, Volume 3, S-A, 693, S-C-A, paragraph 93, where his lordship said the following. The rules of procedural fairness are not applied by rote, but flexibly and contextually, regard being had to the empowering statute. The position was summed up in Russell v. Duke of Norfolk, in which the Court of Appeal stressed that the requirements of natural justice must depend on the circumstances of the case, the nature of the inquiry, the rules under which the tribunal is acting, the subject matter that's being dealt with, and so forth. So, when you ask, when you, if you were to concede in Mr. Magashula's favor that he was entitled to a fair hearing, you must accept that the requirements of a fair hearing differs from case to case, and you must assess it in the conduct, in the context of this case. Now, Mr. Magashula, we submit with respect, was given a fair hearing in the first place by the Integrity Commission. Mm -hmm. The Integrity Commission weren't the final decision makers, but they afforded him a hearing and made a recommendation on which the NEC then acted. And your lordship and your lady would know that it's commonplace in a bigger organization that the function of a fair hearing be performed by one body, i.e. a disciplinary committee, disciplinary inquiry, and that the decision maker might be something in somebody else. The CEO might be the decision maker acting on the recommendation of a um, disciplinary committee. Now, in this case, Mr. Magashula was given a fair hearing by the um, uh, integrity Commission. And if I may ask you to go to its report, because there was some misunderstanding, I suppose, about what it and he said on that occasion. The, the, the copy of the report to which uh, the court has previously been referred is at 001-64. But the report also occurs at 003-310, depending on which copy you prefer to use. Um, I just wish to point to the following features of the report. Firstly, on the first page of the report, in those bullet points, the second bullet point, they say Comrade SG emphasized that he was a disciplined cater and he made it clear that he was ready to perform any tasks given to him by the organization. 
He further said that, and then the second bullet point, he would step aside if so instructed by the NEC. And over the page at uh, 311, or that would be 65, in the top paragraph, the, uh, I, the Integrity Commission greatly appreciates the SG's respect for the Integrity Commission. He understands the Commission's mandate and was able freely to refer to the Commission's terms of reference. He confirmed that he had telephonically informed the Chair immediately after criminal charges were laid, that he is presenting himself to the Commission, and that he would stand aside from all positions if instructed by the NEC to do so. So there's a second recorder of that submission to the jurisdiction of the NEC if it were to require him to step down. And then over the next page came the conclusion. My learned friend somehow suggested that the conclusion was qualified in some way, but it is not qualified. If one picks it up in the first paragraph, it starts near the top of the page. The Integrity Commission recommends to the NEC the immediate implementation of the NEC resolution of 6 to 8 August 2020, quoted here for ease of reference. And the resolution which they say must be implemented is the one that reads, caters of the ANC who are formally charged for corruption or other serious crimes must immediately step aside from all leadership positions in the ANC, legislatures or other government structures pending the finalization of their cases. The officials, as mandated, will develop guidelines and procedures on the implementation, and the next NWC meeting will review progress. And then in bold, in cases where this has not happened, such individuals will be instructed to step aside. So much for the resolution. And then the Integrity Commission continues and says, the NEC's attention is drawn to the last sentence above. So that is saying very, very clearly that he must be suspended. That was the Integrity Commission recommendation. And let me just emphasize how this hearing differed from the one the President had before the Integrity Commission. The, the hearing that Mr. Magashula had, had all the hallmarks of Audi. He was put on terms. He realized that what he was there for is to debate the question whether the NEC resolution should be implemented against him by suspension on the basis of, um, of his indictment. That was the issue. It was raised with him. It was debated with him. He said, if they order me, I'll go. And the recommendation was, yes, you must implement this decision against him. That's uh, full and wholesome Audi. When we later get to the president, you'll see it was a completely different matter altogether. But then it wasn't only that he had this hearing in the Integrity Commission. He was a member of the NEC at every step of the way. In, in the, at the meeting of um, 13 to 14 February 2021, he was a member of the NEC when it adopted the guidelines. He had every opportunity there to voice his opinion on the question whether they should adopt the guidelines. We don't know whether he participated in that discussion, but he at least had an opportunity to speak. And that's all that Audi requires, an opportunity to speak. He was a member of the NEC at the meeting on 26 to 29 March 2021, when it resolved that members who stand indicted for corruption must step aside within 30 days. He knew very well that that resolution particularly applied to him, not only to him, but particularly applied to him. And if implemented, would result in his, um, in his suspension. So he was again a member of the body and participated in the decision to implement the suspension rules to a category of people which included him. He had every opportunity to have his say in that meeting. Mr. Trendov, could I, could I ask you this? To, to the extent that those meetings didn't discuss individual cases, uh, 
yeah. but really were concerned with broad principles that would apply to categories of persons. Yeah. Would it firstly have been appropriate for him to use that opportunity to advance his case where others who are not affected by others who may have been affected by that would have been excluded? And would that then constitute a, a fair opportunity to um, give effect to your Audi rights under those circumstances? Well, let me say to, uh, at, at least this, that he knew that if that resolution is adopted, that that would finalize the case for suspension against him, because it was a resolution that everybody who stands uh, indicted for corruption charges uh, must step aside within 30 days or otherwise be suspended. So that he realized full well that they were not but merely adopting a principle, they were adopting a rule which, if applied to him, would result in his suspension. So he had every opportunity to say and to debate whether that rule should be uh, adopted or not and whether it should be absolute or not. But having adopted that rule, it inevitably and um, uh, irreversibly seal these fate. And then, you'll remember, um, I'm afraid you are muted, my lord. I can you, see. Oh. You, you're still muted. Uh, my lord, uh, my screen suggests that your that your microphone is muted. Uh, Judge, I can see you and hear you, and it's unmuted your microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, I see Judge Wiener as well; her microphone's unmuted, and I can see her. Um, I don't see Judge Mola clearly on camera. And I think he is muted at the moment. So I'm not too sure what the issue is. I see him on camera, but he's muted. Yeah. Can, can, can you hear us? Uh, if you can, not. Okay. We, we can't hear you. So uh, shall we give you an opportunity? It appears that you are muted from the icon we see on the screen. Who are you, sorry, who are you talking to, Judge Collison? Uh, I'm talking to, to Judge Malasheli. So... Uh, uh. Yes, I did uh, send him a message, and he did say he's not on the screen, but he can hear and see. He can hear what's going on. Okay, um, except we we can't hear him now because he, he has a question that he, oh, he I wants. Oh, Yes. But he is muted on this. Maybe he needs. He, he appears to be muted. Yes. Okay, no, I'll call okay. him. Okay. <laughs> I would recommend that he exit and rejoin the meeting. Um, that normally fixes this issue. Mr. Tengo, I'm not sure if you got that question. There was some signing there. So were you able to pick up the question? No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, let's let's try and get him to reconnect here. Okay. So what I'm going to do, if that's all right, I'm going to remove Judge Mala clearly from the meeting because sometimes it, it doesn't show when they've exited. And then he can rejoin us. I'm just worried if he is asking questions uh, <laughs> with sign language, the recording won't pick up on it because I don't have him on my screen at all. Thank you. I hope I'm now reconnected. Can you hear me? Love yes, yes. yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, okay. good. Right. Beatrice, uh, I think somebody has joined the meeting with the name Katato Madisa from the Sunday Times. I, I had actually sent you a message requesting that if you could leave the meeting and rejoin. That has been the blockage on particularly my camera. But be that as it may, I am now back. Uh, Mr. Tango, the question I wanted to ask was that the argument that was put by 
on behalf of uh, Mr. Mahashuli was that the ultimate decision to suspend was made by NEC and not the commission. And, and therefore, the failure to meet the standard of fair hearing happened at the NEC level. What's your comment on that? No, with respect, as I suggested, for instance, in a, you would know, my lord, in a, uh, a large workplace, a disciplinary inquiry is often undertaken by a disciplinary committee, which makes a recommendation to the CEO, who then implements the recommendation. So the requirement of fairness does not require that the ultimate decision maker personally undertake the inquiry as long as there is a fair hearing by an appropriate body, which then makes a recommendation to the decision maker. That's my first answer. But the second is then is this, that insofar as the NEC and the NWC were the ultimate decision makers, Mr. Mahashula participated in those decisions. He was in those meetings and he had every opportunity to speak up when those decisions were taken that culminated in his suspension. And that was so right from the beginning, well, forever, but in any event in February, when the guidelines were adopted and in March, when the 30 day rule was adopted. Thereafter followed the NWC meeting and you will know that the ultimate uh, execution of the suspension was done pursuant to resolutions of the NWC. Now, there was first an NWC meeting on the 12th of April. That was in the 30 day period while it was running. And it affirmed the NEC decision that everybody indicted on a charge of corruption must um, step aside within 30 days. And then there came the, the vital NWC meeting um, on the, um, sorry, sorry, I should have added, there were further meetings with the senior leadership of the party or the top six. Firstly, a meeting with Ms. Duarte and Mr. Mashatile, but then also a meeting at the president's home on the 2nd of May, that's on the eve of the critical NWC meeting. And at those meetings too, his position was discussed. And Ms. Duarte says that in that meeting at the president's home, quote, we gave him audience. In other words, we afford him, him an opportunity to have his say. There was then the critical NWC meeting where the final decision was taken on the 3rd of May where it decided to implement the NEC decision by suspending those who stand uh, indicted on charges of corruption by suspending them. Now, that decision was taken at, on the 3rd of May, again, while he was present at that meeting and he participated in that decision-making process. So, <coughs> with respect that this is an extraordinary case where <clears throat> the suspended employee was not merely afforded an opportunity to state his case, which is what Audi requires, but that he was in this unusual position where he actively participated in the decision-making process, in the decision-making structures when they took the decision which culminated in his suspension. So, that was far more than Audi ever requires because the high water mark of Audi is an opportunity to address the decision maker. In this case, he was part of the decision maker and participated in that decision. And, and so whether Audi was required under the fundamental rules of fairness or under section 19 of the constitution, we submit that uh, uh, he had Audi in ample helpings, and therefore the suggestion that he wasn't given an opportunity to be heard is unfounded. And, and if, we, if the argument is that Audi 
in the context of this, or, or, or the, the suspension in the context of this matter was not a disciplinary uh, outcome, I would take it that it would mean that the flexible rules of Audi would then actually apply because it says you don't have to have your technical, formal, step-by-step yeah. -step hearing. No, absolutely, my lord. So that he has a number of hurdles to overcome. We submit in the first place on the basis of the Concord Authority that the, that the rules of fundamental justice did not require any hearing at all. But your lordship is quite correct that even if a hearing was required, the flexibility of Audi uh, dictated that a hearing could take many forms. Uh, and this hearing he was afforded went far, far beyond what Audi required. Remember, what Audi requires is that you be put on terms about the, that you be told about the adverse decisions that may be taken against you and be given an opportunity <clears throat> to address the decision makers on the question whether those decisions should be made. And I emphasize this because I'm later going to contrast it with what happened to the president. The suggestion that he had a had Audi merely because he appeared before the Integrity Commission on something else is, is with respect far-fetched. But for the moment, I'm dealing with Mr. Mahashule. His, apart from the Audi complaint and the Section 19 complaint, which now collapses into one, his complaint is also, his third complaint is that Mr. Duarte, the Deputy Secretary General, did not have the power to suspend under um, Rule 2570 because Rule 2570 vests the power of suspension in the Secretary General. Now, let me say this is an extraordinary argument because it persisted in in through the affidavits and in the heads of argument and in this hearing before you. The suggestion that the only person in the ANC who had the power to suspend Mr. Mahashula was Mr. Mahashula himself. One merely needs to articulate that suggestion to realize how absurd it must be that Mr. Mahashula was the sole judge in his own cause of whether he should be suspended under Rule 20, uh, 2570 or not. That clearly must be wrong because he's the last person in the world competent to take a lawful decision on his own fate. Because it, for him to do so would fly in the face of the fundamental rules, even uh, more fundamental than Audi, and that is that one can never sit in judgment on your own case. In the corporate context, one can't take a decision in which you have a personal interest because you are conflicted from doing so. So what is the answer? The answer is, with the greatest of respect, that Rule 16.9 makes it quite clear that the Deputy Secretary General can exercise that power in the stead of the Secretary General on two different grounds. We quote 16.9 in our Heads of Argument on page 35, that's 008-102, paragraph 66. The rule reads as follows. The Deputy Secretary General shall assist the Secretary General deputize for him or her when necessary and carry out the functions entrusted to the Secretary General by the National Conference, the National Council, the NEC or the NWC and shall be an ex officio member of the NWC. So there are two grounds there, if I may go back. The Deputy Secretary General shall assist the Secretary General, one, deputize for him. So she may deputize for him. Deputize clearly means to act in his stead or to stand in for him. That is what deputize means um, when necessary. This was clearly a case where it was necessary that somebody should stand in for him because he was personally disqualified from taking the decision on his own um, suspension. But alternatively, or in, in additional, 
She is also empowered to carry out the functions entrusted to the Secretary General by any of those structures, including the NWC. Well, this was this, an instruction by the NWC that everybody indicted on a charge of corruption who has not stepped down within the 30 days must be suspended. So again, on that basis too, she um, had the power to carry out the instruction of the NWC. And in this case, in fact, it was the NEC and the NWC that authorized this decision because the NEC adopted that decision in March, which says everybody indicted for corruption must uh, step aside within 30 days, and if they don't, must be suspended. So that was an NEC decision in the first place. That decision was confirmed and then implemented by the NWC. So both of them authorized this suspension and she was fully entitled to act, act under their authority. Um, the, the third objection, third ground on which Mr. Mahashula attacks his suspension is that he says that there was no compliance with um, Rule 2570. Well, I've read you the rule. Uh, I would suggest that there are at least three requirements or four requirements. The first is that the member, uh, we list them, by the way, in our heads of argument in paragraph 75. The member must have been indicted to appear in the court of law. He clearly qualified. The NEC or NWC must have authorized the suspension of the member. Well, that happened in this case. The security, uh, security, the secretary general must be satisfied that the suspension of the member would be in the best interest of the ANC. I'll come back to that one. The, and then the um, secretary general then has the discretion to suspend. Now, I've suggested as far as three and four is concerned, that it was lawful for the deputy secretary general to step into the shoes of the secretary general for the performance of those functions. And then my learned friend, Mr. Um, Mpofu, argued that she said in the letter of suspension only that the NWC was satisfied that it was in the interest of the party that he be suspended. But she made it plain in her answering affidavit that she too shared that view. And my learned friend said that that wasn't so, but she made it clear. Uh, I think he referred to the fact that she said so, but he somehow wouldn't accept it. If I can just emphasize her answer <coughs> at 003-50, paragraph 92, where she says the following, both the NWC and I were satisfied that the suspension of members indicted on charges of corruption or other serious crimes was in the best interest of the ANC, and that the applicant was a member who fell in this category. We thus satisfied that requirement of the rule. Now, <coughs> sorry, Mr. Tringo. Um, Mr. Mpoku's point seemed to be that this was an ex post facto uh, satisfaction, if we can put it that way. No, that's true. At the time. He said she didn't say it in the letter, and therefore it's not true. But she says it is, and Plascon Evans tells you how to resolve that. Well, there isn't really a conflict. Nobody says otherwise. It's merely my learned friend who makes a different submission. But there's no evidence to the contrary, and therefore her evidence stands uncontradicted. But if there is a contradiction, Plascon Evans determines that her account must be accepted. Um, so we submit with respect that satisfies all of the requirements of 2570 and that Mr. Mahashula's contention to the contrary <coughs> is not, um, is unfounded. Now I turn then to the suspension of the president. We've had an extraordinary uh, 
submission this morning. Sorry, Mr. Trangov, before we go to the suspension of the president, one of the arguments relating to the suspension of the Secretary General is that the Deputy Secretary General um, had a discussion with him and requested that he be he signed some documents relating to conferences which were to be held. Could you just deal with that issue briefly? Yes, she explains that she, uh, I think he had initially attempted some appeal or review, and she thought that the appeal or review suspended the suspension and therefore that he was still in office. But let me make this clear that uh, even if she actually thought that he was still in office, then she made a mistake of law. And that doesn't take this case anywhere. It doesn't in any way uh, detract from the validity of the suspension uh, because she had a, a mistake of fact, maybe, because she thought that there was a, uh, an appeal and that the sus appeal suspended her decision or that she simply made a, a mistake of law. Her opinion of the legal consequences of the suspension is irrelevant. Okay, thank you. We come to the suspension of the president. Now let me say that this is an extraordinary case because Mr. Mahashula comes to court to defend his suspension of the president, which was avowedly a suspension under Rule 2570. And he comes to court to defend that suspension, despite the fact, despite various things. Firstly, that he now claims that Rule 2570 is a nullity, and yet he defends his suspension made under that rule. He defends that suspension despite the fact that um, the president was not afforded any hearing whatsoever. And the suggestion, I'll return to it, but the suggestion that the president was afforded a hearing on the question of his suspension by the Integrity Commission is fanciful. Thirdly, he uh, purported to suspend the president on the authority of the NWC. He now denies that the NWC had the authority to authorize the suspension. And in the first place, he, um, uh, he can't claim, I mean, he does claim, but he can't credibly claim that either the NEC or the NWC in fact authorized his suspension as Rule 2570 requires. And yet in the face of all of these contradictions, with his own case, he persists in contending that the president's suspension was valid. May I ask you please to go to the letter of suspension. The best copy is actually at uh, 003490. It's a far better copy than the other one to which you've been referred, which is much reduced. Sorry, double three zero. Uh, double zero three yep. dash four nine zero. Thank you. And I'd like to take you to the letter with some care because you will, I will submit to you that this is a thoroughly dishonest but also thoroughly legally flawed letter. And you will see that it patently purported to be a suspension under Rule 2570 and for that reason distorted the facts in an attempt to bring it within 2570, but did so on spurious grounds. And may I remind you that 2570 in its opening sentence makes it plain that it only applies to people who have been indicted on a, a criminal offence. So, in this letter, you will see how Mr. Mahashula claimed to be acting under Rule 2570, couldn't claim that the president had been indicted, but then did his best 
to create a semblance of compliance with that requirement. Um, on the first page of the letter, you could go to the third and fourth paragraphs where he says the following, properly read and interpreted, the conference resolution in this regard provides that all cadres charged or reported to be involved in corrupt practices ought to step aside or be summarily suspended. Remember, that was his original complaint. The, the uh, guidelines are confined to people who are indicted, but he invokes the conference resolution, which extends to anybody who's accused of corruption. He was quite wrong, of course, about the guidelines, but that's what he said at the time. And then look at paragraph four. You have been reported to the serious offenses director, that's to the Hawks. You have been reported to the Hawks and the matter of sealed documents relating to your CR17 campaign prior and during the 54th National Conference is pending before our courts. Now, do you see that attempt to characterize this as an indictment before the court? It is a spurious attempt. It's a dishonest attempt, but that is what it is. That explains that language. He tries to bring it within the language of Rule 2570. And then he goes on. On 3 May 2021, the NWC, acting in terms of Rule 2570, there he invokes the rules, the rule expressly. The NWC, acting in terms of Rule 2570, read with Rule 13, instructed that letters be written to all affected members, including yourself, to inform them that it has decided that their temporary suspension would be in the best interests of the organization. Again, a dishonest and um, fundamentally flawed attempt to bring himself within 2570. Because under 2570, you will recall, not only does it, not only is it limited to people who have been indicted, but the suspension may only occur on the authority of the NEC or the NWC. So this is where he invokes the NWC authority for his suspension of the president under Rule 2570. But it's dishonest. He was at that meeting. He knows very well that the decision was limited to people who have been indicted for corruption and failed to step down within 30 days. He knew very well that it had nothing whatsoever to do with the president because he's never been indicted. And that rule never applied to him. To suggest not only that he thought that the president should be suspended, but that the NWC authorized the president's suspension was a plainly dishonest statement. He then goes on, according to resolution eight of the 54th conference, secretaries at all levels will be held accountable for the failure to take action or refer matters of corruption or other misconduct in terms of the ANC code of conduct to the relevant structures. That doesn't take this suspension any further. As stated above, it has been reported, Comrade President, that you and your NASREC campaign team raised money in an attempt to get the branches to finally elect you as president of the ANC. It is common cause that this matter has been ventilated in our courts. See again that transparent attempt to characterize this as an indictment before the court. He invokes he claims that the CR17 involvement is somehow a matter that has been ventilated in our courts and that documents relating there to remain sealed. The particular matter uh, relating to the sealing of the documents is pending before our court. And then on the next page, he goes on. The 15th of July, that's when you'll be able to actually get your vaccine if you are 50 or over. Have a listen to what Nicholas Chris from the health department. Judge, I have just muted everyone. Mr. Trengrove, you're on mute. 
Thanks, Peter. Okay. And now. Yes, we can hear you now, Mr. Tringle. He goes on on the next page. Comrade President, you will require, uh, you will recall that quite apart from this matter being reported to our law enforcement agencies, that's again a referral to the report to the Hawks, which is false. The ANC has lamented the use <coughs> of money in its internal election at conferences. Based on the way forward emanating from the last NWC, a number of comrades face suspension from the ANC. Yes, that's true. He was there. That's the meeting of the 3rd of May. The NWC meeting was that people indicted for corruption who haven't stepped aside within 30 days must be suspended. And he knows very well that has nothing to do with the president. And look at the next paragraph. Accordingly, on the authority of the NWC, now remember that refers back to the fifth paragraph on the previous page where, I, where he says that was the NWC acting in terms of Rule 2570. So this sentence in the third paragraph on the second page means acting on the authority of the NWC acting in terms of Rule 2570. And as a result of the allegations referred to here above, you are hereby temporarily suspended. So it's a, it's a, he purports to suspend the president um, under authority of the MWC acting in terms of rule 2570. And he tries to get by the requirement of an indictment by making vague allegations about reports, false accusations about reports to the Hawks about the activities of CRC, uh, CR 17. And then to confirm that he's acting under 2570, he goes on in the next page. In line with <coughs> rule 2570, the following terms and conditions are imposed. And he copies uh, much the same thing as was uh, done in his suspension letter. So it, his original case that he advanced in this letter and that he advanced in his founding out today was that he, this was a suspension under Rule 2570, on the authority of the NWC, um, and on the basis of uh, these allegations that have been made or reported to the Hawks about CR 17. Well, the President makes it clear that those allegations are false. Nobody has ever suggested that there was any criminality in CR 17. A full bench of the High Court has held that there was no evidence of any misconduct at all in, on the part of uh, CR 17 or the President. Uh, so that the, these allegations are, are, are false and, have, and denied by the President and have been refuted. But apart from the fact that they are false, the, uh, in other words, the, that the underlying facts are, on which he bases his decision are false. He knows that there's been no indictment and he knows that there's no NWC authority and that disqualifies the purported suspension under Rule 2570. So it's a, it's a dishonest uh, attempt to suspend the president on spurious grounds. And not only is it dishonest, but he then very piously but falsely pretends that he thought he was merely doing his duty to suspend the president. We quote him in our heads of argument in paragraph 82, that's on page 0008-109. Just listen to this, knowing what you do about these facts. He said the following about his suspension of the president, and I quote, I must point out that although I felt duty bound to carry out the instructions of the NWC, I based my own belief that the entire set aside regime was irregular and would not withstand legal scrutiny if challenged. I did so reluctantly and only out of a sense of duty. And a little later, I specifically dispute the lawfulness of the instruction 
that I should apologize for what was a bona fide exercise of my responsibilities as instructed by the NWC, irrespective of my own known private views at the time. What does one make of this dishonest, uh, pious claim that he thought that he was acting uh, in the performance of his duties? One does what the president does to infer that this is an obviously dishonest and vindictive attempt to retaliate against the president for his own for his own suspension. Our learned friends, Mr. Mahashula argues, and our learned friends repeat today, that it could have couldn't have been a retaliation because the two suspension letters were only delivered on the 5th of May, and we don't know in which sequence it was done. <laughs> But that is not the point. He sat in the NWC meeting on the 3rd of May when it was decided that he must be suspended. So he walked out of that meeting knowing that he was about to be suspended. And that is why he retaliated. Um, and there's no other credible explanation for his conduct. This suggestion that he reluctantly acted merely as a... Uh, faithful servant of the organization is patently false. Um, and what's more, what that pious explanation does is that it also destroys any suggestion or destroys the credibility of any suggestion that he applied his mind to the requirements of uh, Rule 2570. If he says, I, I only acted, I only suspended the president because I reluctantly did so, because it was my duty, then it means I didn't exercise the discretion to do so, which would in itself destroy the validity of his suspension of the president. That was his old case, the one set out in the letter and the one that he pleaded. He now makes a new case under the authority which he says was delegated to him by the NEC in that letter of January 2018. Now, let me say of this new cause of action, it's in the first place not a cause of action that was pleaded in his founding affidavit. It was pleaded for the first time in reply. And that in itself is fatal. We cite the most recent, oh, it's a tight proposition, but we cite the most recent uh, authority, Constitutional Court and SCA authority, in our heads of argument on in paragraph 87 and footnote 83. And there was again, uh, there's a reference to the Chaleika concert judgment of the Lordship Council Justice Cameron in the Constitutional Court, and then also in the SCA in ESO's case, to which we referred in a different context. Both of them say you can't raise a constitutional attack only and apply, and that's fatal. That should be the end of the matter. We secondly said, but because it was raised for the first time in reply, we don't know, court doesn't know whether the delegation was valid. We now know that it was. My learned friend mentioned it this morning, and it's quite correct that we have subsequently obtained instructions on that letter of delegation. And it was confirmed that that was indeed a valid delegation and is still in force. Um, um, and that was the delegation on which uh, Ms. Duarte relied for delegate for the delegation to her of authority to litigate on behalf of the ANC. It's the same resolution. So we accept that there was a valid delegation. What we don't accept is that he acted under that delegation. Um, because he avowedly acted under or purported to act under NWC authority in terms of Rule 2570. So, and you can't um, uh, switch horses in this way, where each, uh, the, each power has its own requirements of which he needs to satisfy himself before it is exercised. You, apart from a pleading point, you can't, when you acted under uh, Rule 2570 as a pious employee doing his duty, now claim that you actually acted under a different delegation of a completely different power, because he didn't. 
we didn't consider the requirements for the exercise of that power. And what's more, what does that delegation mean? We agree that it is a wide delegation, but one thing that it cannot do is to delegate to him a power to override the NEC. And let me just explain. By this time, the NEC had already decided how to give effect to the conference resolutions. It had decided to give effect to the conference resolutions by way by the application of the guidelines. That was an NEC decision. Now, Mr. Mahashula cannot claim under that delegation from the NEC a power to override the NEC itself, whatever else that delegation might mean. The agent can never acquire the power from his principal to override the principal's decisions. And that is what he purported to do because he purported, or he says he purported, to um, ignore the NEC decision on the implementation of the step aside rule and to invoke the, uh, the, the conference rule. That power he doesn't have to override the NEC. Um, but even if he did, as I've said, he didn't act under that power. He, he, um, he attempted to, he, well, he says that he was entitled to switch horses in this way because the Latib principle allowed him to do so. Now, the Latib principle derived from the Latib case says that where a functionary has a statutory power which he exercises, <coughs> which he intends to exercise and does exercise. <clears throat> but he makes a mistake in the exercise of the power. He mentions the wrong number of this, he gets the number of the section wrong. Then it doesn't matter if in fact he had that power under a different section which he from the one that he mentioned, the exercise of the power is not invalid. But it doesn't say that you can switch horses. You can first exercise a power under, exercise one power, and when you discover that it was flawed, then seek to uphold the exercise of the power under a different provision. And that was made clear by our courts, most recently by Justice Cameron, the Howey judgment. We quote him in our paragraph 91, where he says the following, the doctrine does not validate action taken. That's the Latib doctrine. The doctrine does not validate action taken in deliberate reliance on a provision that does not authorize it, even where another provision exists that may warrant it. Nor can an original general power to act cure an invalid exercise of a specific power. And he then goes on. But let me just say, emphasize that first sentence. The negative doctrine does not validate action taken in deliberate reliance on a provision, i.e. on 2570, that does not authorize it because he didn't comply with the section. So the attempt to switch horses under the Latif principle is, um, is unfounded. Now let me say then also that I did an injustice to my learned friend, Marcelo, uh, earlier when I said that she, for the first time, invoked Rule 1661. It's been pointed out to me that that's not correct. It was raised in um, Mr. Magashula's founding affidavit at 001-41, paragraph 124. So I can't, I don't, I retract the complaint that that's a new suggestion. But that was certainly not what he did in his letter. His letter made it absolutely clear that he acts under 2570 and not under uh, Rule 1661. And if you refer to Rule 1661, you will see that this attempt 
to justify the suspension of the president is also um, bad in law. Rule 1661 uh, is F003-82. And it reads as follows. The Secretary General is the Chief Administrative Officer of the ANC. He or she shall communicate the decisions of all national structures of the ANC on behalf of the NEC. So that's merely a power to be the bearer of, of news. In other words, it's a power merely to distribute information about NEC decisions or uh, national structure decisions on behalf of the NEC. It's not a decision-making power. The Secretary General might have other decision-making powers, but that clause merely um, gives him the power to distribute information. It's not a power to take any decisions. And in any event, it's not a power he purported to exercise in his letter of suspension. So on these grounds, we submit with respect that the president's suspension was bad. By the way, if you hold that there is, we don't contend for an Audi requirement, but if you do hold that rule 2570 um, requires Audi, then the president clearly was not afforded Audi. My well, friend argued this morning that the president was afforded Audi by the Integrity Commission. But what Audi means is notification of the adverse decision contemplation and an opportunity to make representations on that proposal. Now, the one thing that was not considered before the IG uh, before the Integrity Commission, is whether the president should be suspended for some reason or other. That was not considered at all. In fact, the, the uh, CR 17 facts were specifically excluded from their discussion with him. So for Mr. Mahashula to contend, they remember Mr. Mahashula bases his suspension squarely on CR 17, which he characterizes wrongly, but that's the foundation. That is the one issue that was not debated and not decided. So the president wasn't told that anybody uh, contemplates his suspension. He wasn't told on what possible basis that might be so. And there was a different discussion about policy matters, about relating to the use of uh, private money in internal party uh, elections, so that there clearly was no, there was no um, Audi at all, even on the requirements that Mr. Mahashula says applies to this decision. Then there is a last point on the president's suspension, which <clears throat> you will note explains the language of the prayer. The prayer says that the president's suspension must be declared to be, quote, valid and or effective until lawfully nullified. Now, that is an attempt to invoke the Odekral principle because <clears throat> the language would say, even if I suspended the president unlawfully, the, my decision to suspend him stands and must be regarded as valid and binding until it is set aside by review by a court. And in doing so, he purports to invoke the rule that the SCA laid down in, um, in Odekral's case and the Constitutional Court adopted in Curlin's case. And that rule is that administrative action is deemed to be valid um, and effective until lawfully set aside. But that rule is confined to administrative action. It doesn't extend to a 
suspension decision by an official in a, in a political party, which is a private body. In other words, a private decision in a private body. The Odekral decision, um, we, we quote on our page 008-114 uh, from Odekral, from, from Curlin, which in turn quoted from Odekral, which described the principle as follows. The proper functioning of a modern state would be considerably compromised if all administrative acts could be given effect to or ignored, depending on the view take uh, on the view the subject takes of the validity of the act in question. No doubt it is for this reason that our law has always recognized that even an unlawful administrative act is capable of producing legally valid consequences for so long as the unlawful act is not set aside. And the Constitutional Court went on to explain in Curlin, and I quote, the fundamental notion that official conduct is vulnerable to challenge may have legal consequences and may not be ignored until properly set aside, springs deeply from the rule of law. So it's a principle that says the exercise of public power must, in the public interest, be regarded as good and obeyed until it is set aside. It doesn't apply to disciplinary steps taken by a private body under contract. So that attempt to we submit with respect is, um, is unfounded. The president's suspension was both dishonest and unlawful. May I turn then to the retraction and apology? Um, the Mr. Mahashula asks in prayer 2.4 that the instruction issued to him to apologize to the president be declared unlawful and invalid. But it wasn't an instruction at all. It was a request. Um, the request is at 003-661, and you will see that – oh, sorry, I might uh, have given you – I'm not sure that I gave you the right page number. It's also at 003 dash 454, that might be a better page to go to. Like both, both are correct, I think, Mr. Tengrove. Yeah. No, that may be so. Now, you will see that the letter is headed, request to withdraw and apologize. And then, and then the letter says, it cites authority, it's, it cites the history of the suspension of the president. And then it says, the NEC directed the national officials to request you to withdraw your purported letter of suspension to the president and to apologize publicly to the ANC, its structures and members within a set time frame with a proviso that your failure, refusal or neglect to do so will constitute misconduct and the ANC should institute disciplinary action, etc. So it's a request. It's an Afrikaans saying which says, phrase frei. <laughs> One doesn't require a statutory or constitutional authority to make a request. And it is a request without legal consequences at all. It is true that the NEC may later attach disciplinary consequences to his refusal. But it will be his refusal which triggers legal consequences and not the request. And there is, with respect, absolutely no reason why the NEC, which is between conferences the highest authority in the party, should not, for purposes of party discipline, request a member to withdraw a very, very serious and dishonest accusation made against the president of the ANC. So, there is absolutely no substance to the contention that this request was in any way unlawful. 
Um, it has no legal standing. The NEC doesn't claim that it has any legal consequences. It is merely a request. And it had the power to make the request. And there is no justification for the suggestion that the request itself was in some way unlawful. I turn to <coughs> the strikeout application. We filed separate heads of argument in support, uh, in defense to the strikeout application. Our heads of argument are at 008-170. And the heads of argument do deal with the issue quite fully. And I will, for that reason, merely highlight the main features of our response to the um, to the application. We start off by making the point that the very rule under which the application is brought, that is uh, Rule 615, expressly says that the court may not grant an application to strike out any matter quote, unless it is satisfied that the applicant will be prejudiced if the application is not granted. <coughs> there's no prejudice in this case whatsoever. My learned friend says that there's a cost prejudice. Um, Ladyship Justice Wiener has made the point that a cost prejudice can be addressed by appropriate cost order. But let me make it quite plain that that's obviously so. If the court believes that the respondents have inappropriately or excessively um, um, caused the other parties to incur costs, then an appropriate cost order is a remedy. But those costs, for better or for worse, have been incurred. No amount of strikeout is going to prevent them. So that a cost order might be, for other reasons, a remedy for excessive paper, but a strikeout does not prevent any costs, and therefore does not, um, and therefore no prejudice, no additional prejudice will be suffered if you fail to give the strikeout order. And, it's, and for that reason means that in this case, the only prejudice now suggested, not even in the application, the only prejudice now contended for is a cost prejudice. Well, not costs. Those are costs which have been incurred. No costs will be prevented by um, a striking out order. So that we submit with respect, oh, and in support of this requirement, it's expressly spelled out in the rule but it was confirmed in, by the SCA in Bainash's case. That's Bainash, uh, Bainash v. Wixley, 1997, Volume 3, SA, 721, SCA, at page 733, capital A. And that we submit should be the end of the strikeout application. But if we uh, go to the merits of the application beyond the requirement of prejudice. The, Mr. Mahushula very uh, dramatically seeks to have the president's whole affidavit struck out. I must say I've never come across an application of this kind where the whole affidavit of one of the litigants in the case is sought to be struck out. Um, we suspect that his motive is to grandstand rather than to genuinely engage with what is permissible before the court and what is not. There are three chapters to the president's affidavit. The first chapter deals with the importance of organizational unity and renewal in the ANC. The second chapter deals with the president's own suspension. And the third is an application for condemnation. Now, we don't know why Mr. Mahashula wants even the application for condemnation to be struck out. He's not advanced any reasons for it, and we will assume that he actually doesn't intend that part to be struck out. So it leaves the, first, the chapters 
on unity within the ANC and the president's suspension. As far as the chapter on unity within the ANC is concerned, the only attack is that it's irrelevant. So they say the president goes on about unity and renewal in the ANC when that is not relevant to anything before the court. But nothing can be further from the truth. The fact of the matter is that in his founding affidavit, Mr. Mahashula makes a big uh, onslaught on the ANC and the president in particular by contending that the ANC is riven by factionalism and that there are two main factions within the ANC and he calls the dominant faction, he calls the CR17 faction under the leadership of the president. And Mr. Mahashula then tears the party apart on these factionless grounds. Now, we've not heard any of the factionalism being advanced as a, in, in support of his case yeah, but he made that case in his founding papers. We quote the paragraphs, or we cite the paragraphs in our paragraph seven of our heads, and you'll see that it is reams and reams of paper which Mr. Mahashula devoted to this issue. And we quote three uh, juicy bits from those paragraphs. I'm not going to read them now, but their theme is, a current theme, that the ANC is riven by factionalism. The dominant CR17 factionalism, uh, faction, are abusing the step-aside rule to rid themselves of the political foes of whom I am the main target. So it is a it is an imputation of bad faith on the part of the, really the majority of the NEC, dominated, he says, by the CR17 faction. Now, the president then deals with that accusation, that theme, in his chapter on unity and renewal in the ANC. And what the chapter makes clear is that <clears throat> the suggestion that the application of the step aside rule is merely a bad faith device used by one faction of the party can't be further from the truth. That it was the, a watershed moment at the 1917 Nasrit conference that the, NEC, that, the, that the ANC in national conference decided to set its face against corruption and to take positive steps to root it out. And that everything as the, the implementation of the set aside rule has flowed from that watershed decision of the national conference. So to attribute it to the vindictive uh, abuse by a faction within the ANC is insulting and untrue. Now, I don't need to persuade you that the president's account should be preferred, it clearly should under Plascon Evans. For, for, per, for present purposes, um, it, all I need to persuade you of is that it's relevant to the matters raised in the founding affidavit. Well, clearly relevant, it's a direct response to the Mr. Mahashula's factionalism uh, complaint. Then the president deals. Sorry, Mr. Trengoff, I was saying in relation to the strike out, the complaint is also that the respondents duplicated papers which were already contained in the founding affidavits. Yes, you're quite right, um, Lord. And I'm going to deal with the duplication complaint. I'll do so okay. shortly. Um, I, yes, I'm getting to that shortly. The the first, you'll, but you'll remember that the first uh, category of document that they want to be struck out <coughs> is the whole of the president's affidavit, and then they get to the duplication, and I will I will certainly deal with that. Um, <coughs> it, the second topic the president addresses in his affidavit is his own suspension. And there are really two parts to that chapter, and we distinguish between them. 
and that the first is Mr. Mahashula's distortion of the CR17 facts. <coughs> and then the second is the Mr. Mahashula's implementation of his own suspension of the president, which was fatally flawed. So we deal with them separately. Now, I have taken you through Mr. Mahashula's suspension letter addressed to the president. So I don't need to take you back there. But what you will recall is that the very foundation of his purported justification of the suspension was the CR17 campaign, the president's involvement in the campaign, the reports made to the uh, <coughs> to made to the Hawks about the campaign, and the <coughs> suggestion that these matters are before the court. He was the one who made the point that these matters are before the court. So what the president does to set the record straight is he tells the CR17 story. He, in the first place, does so by explaining that CR17 was a perfectly innocent and lawful campaign. And he doesn't do so afresh because he's already done so in submissions made to the public protector. So what the president does, remember that this is now a president under the pressure of an urgent application called upon to justify CR17. He says, I have already just told the full story to the public protector, and he does the sensible and convenient thing to say, here it is, here are my representations I made to the public protector, and I confirm that those representations are true. So it is merely his method of defending the legality and propriety of the CR17 campaign. To suggest that it's irrelevant is with respect to uh, ignore the fact that CR17 made the basis of, the, of his own suspension. And, and then he says, and remember, remember again the suspension letter, and Mr. Magashula doesn't only falsely claim that CR17 has been reported to the Hawks, but he also says repeatedly that the matter is before our court in his attempt to give it the semblance of an indictment before the court. So the president quite justifiably says, yes, it has been before the courts, but let me tell you why it has been there. It has been there only because the public protector undertook an unlawful investigation of the CR17. <coughs> I took her to court and a full bench of this court held that the investigation was unlawful and vindicated the lawfulness and propriety of the campaign itself, held that there was nothing unlawful about the campaign, held that the president's conduct in relation to the CR17 campaign was perfectly lawful. Here is the judgment. Now, again, it's not because the president doesn't invoke the, the courts because as, as a, uh, a um, as an unrelated ally. He invokes the courts because Mr. Magashula was the one who said CR17 has been before the courts. And then it's perfectly legitimate for the president to say, yes, and let me show you what happened before the courts. Your suggestion that this is akin to an indictment before a court on a criminal charge can't be further from the truth. So that is, uh, account of the CR17 facts, his method of doing so by incorporating his explanation to the public protector, <clears throat> and his referral and incorporating, uh, incorporation of the judgment to make the point that the court vindicated him, all of it was directly relevant to the charges made against Mr. Mangula in his letter of suspension. The second part of the president's um, uh, chapter on his own suspension then deals with the unlawfulness of Mr. Mahashula's implementation of, um, the, of, of the requirements of regulation of, of Rule 2570. Well, I, I, I mean, that is directly relevant to the core of this case to suggest that it's somehow 
irrelevant is with respect. Oh, one, of, one point that I seek to make, I said, well, the ANC has already dealt with the whole history of the implementation of Step Aside, and it wasn't necessary for the president to do so. But that is firstly not true. The, the, any, uh, the ANC affidavit defended the NEC's implementation of the uh, Step Aside rule, defended uh, Rule 2570, and defended the um, suspension of Mr. Mahashula. When it came to the particular facts relating to the suspension of the president, the ANC affidavit says, we don't deal with this, we'll leave it to the president. So that was left to the president. He was the only one who dealt with, specifically dealt with uh, the unlawfulness of his own suspension. So there was, it was directly relevant and there was no duplication there. And then the Lordship is quite correct. There's a different category of attack. So far for the attack, so, so, so. so far for the application to strike out the president's entire affidavit, there is no substance to it at all. There is a different category of document that they seek to have struck out. And that is what we have called the duplicated annexures. That is annexures that occur in both uh, in more than one affidavit, either founding plus one of the respondents or founding plus two of the respondents, or in the two respondents. So there's some duplication of, of annexures. Well, let me say, firstly, the, they say that the duplicated documents in total come to 78 pages. 78 pages out of a record which my last check on uh, on case lines suggested that the record ran to more than 2,000 pages. But it's a duplication of 78 pages. There is no rule against duplication. There is a rule against unnecessary verbiage and wasting of costs. But if two respondents, ANC and the president, under the pressure of an um, urgent application, in two work streams, each prepare their own affidavit, then, it, then they are perfectly entitled to say, I pre prepare to structure my affidavit in the way that suits me best. And I want to take the reader to be relevant to my, um, uh, to my defense in, by annexing my own sequence of annexures. And if there is then uh, a duplication of annexures, we submit with respect that the duplication doesn't render anything inadmissible. They are all admissible. The only complaint, if there is one, is that there is an unnecessary incurring of costs. That's got nothing to do with strikeout. Strikeout will also not avoid it, avoid those costs. If, uh, if there is a remedy, then it's to disallow some of those costs. But I do want to emphasize that Litigants who make serious affidavits on oath must, in the first place, be afforded the discretion to in whatever way they deem to, the, to be at their best advantage. Only excesses ought to be frowned upon. Mr. Mr. Trengrove, you'd, you'd accept the principle that, that the court, in, in terms of its inherent jurisdiction, may also be entitled to look at the the cost that may be incurred in litigation. And while you point out that it's not a significant number in relation to the whole, yeah. you'd accept that the court has ultimately a discretion on cost in general, and it may yeah. well exercise this discretion in respect of duplicated documents. Uh, absolutely, my lord. And, uh, but that is where the remedy lies if there is a, uh, a legitimate complaint. It's in some order for costs, not a strikeout. Strikeout doesn't avoid costs. The third category of documents to which um, the applicant objects are certain targeted um, annexures, which he says are irrelevant. Well, we deal with them in our heads of argument from 0008-181. And I'm not going to take you through all of them because we deal with them one by one. And you'll see that all of them are highly relevant. Um, it's just inexplicable 
that Mr. Mahashula should contend that they are irrelevant. There was the president's political overview. You remember that was the overview the president gave in the, uh, that it was a submission by the president to the NEC conference in August last year. Well, what that was, was part of the story of how the conference resolutions ultimately got translated and applied <coughs> the, um, in the NEC guidelines. And that story is told, it starts with the August uh, 2020 NEC conference. And in his political overview, the president invoked the conference resolutions and then implores the party to now, NEC, to now in, implement those resolutions and persuades the NEC at that meeting to mandate the officials to draft the, what became a guideline. So it's a critical part of that story, which lays the link from conference resolution to guidelines. The, the, the provincial reports, one of the complaints of Mr. Mahashula is that the step aside rule as implemented by the NEC was aimed at him. Well, there are a number, there's much evidence and a number of documents placed before um, the court to demonstrate that the step aside rule was widely applied, not only at national level, but also at provincial level and clearly refutes any suggestion made by Mr. Mahashula that uh, he was singled out as a target. Now, the provincial reports do exactly that. They demonstrate how the party did an audit of all everybody in the provinces who are liable to step aside and who failed to do so, and then invoked the step aside rule against those parties. Very many people, and uh, in the report you'll see that in, to maintain their privacy, the particular names have been redacted, but there are very many names referred to. Mr. Mahashula complains about the fact that the president or the ANC uh, annexed his indictment. But uh, it's, uh, it is inexplicable that he could suggest that his indictment is irrelevant. He was the one who said in his founding affidavit, and I quote, that the allegations of wrongdoing against him were allegations to, of a failure to implement oversight. And he said, no other public official in the history of South Africa has ever faced criminal charges in respect of indirect criminal liability for lack of oversight. And he described it as an oddity, if not downright absurdity. Well, he invited an analysis of his indictment. The best evidence of the indictment is the indictment itself, which the ANC then annexed, and it placed before the court an analysis of that indictment, which makes it clear that the charges he faces are stock standard but very serious charges of corruption, fraud, and money laundering. None of this uh, an oddity, if not downright absurdity. So it's di directly relevant, and it shows that his description is false. The letter to the provincial secretaries also shows the scope of the application of the uh, step aside rule. The Bongo letter of suspension, same thing, also shows that other people were suspended. The uh, supporting affidavits, well, there are a number of supporting affidavits which are annexed merely to show that Ms. Duarte's evidence is not her own eccentric opinion, but is supported by leading lights in the party. So for that reason also directly relevant, as relevant as her own evidence. And there's lastly the CR17 documents, that is the um, submission to the public protector and the full bench judgment. I've already explained that those documents were highly relevant uh, precisely because Mr. Mahashula made CR-17 the foundation of his attack, of his suspension. 
There remains one little topic, um, and that is <coughs> our learned friend's contention that the president um, should have applied, the president and the ANC should have applied for condemnation for the late filing of their affidavit. Um, and by late filing, he doesn't mean in breach of the rules. They didn't breach any rules at all. He means that they failed to file by the dates he demanded that they should. Well, it's an extraordinary thing. And he then complains, he then accuses them yesterday of arrogance. It's an extraordinary thing that Mr. Mahashula thinks that he can prescribe to the president and the ANC when they should file their affidavits, and that if they don't meet his prescription that they have to beg the court for condemnation for not complying with his rules. Well, let me just give you the facts. You will see on the record that the application was served on the 14th of May. Under Rule 6, that would have given, in the ordinary course, would have given the respondents five days to file a notice of intention to defend and 10 days, that's court days, for an answer. That's 15 court days, three weeks. It would have taken them to the 4th of June. Mr. Mahashula, despite the fact that he only uh, served on the 14th of May, demanded that the respondents file their answer on 20 May. That would have been four, four court days later. And then my learned friend says that without telling them anything, the respondents just filed late. But that is not so. I have been given the correspondence from my attorney to his attorney, and we'll place it um, on case lines. But let me just make it quite clear that the president and the ANC's attorney treated this issue and their attorney with the greatest of respect and collegiality. You see, uh, remember the deadline, the four-day deadline was for 20 May. Well, on 18 May, Ledwawa Mazwai addressed a letter to um, Mabuza attorneys in which he said in paragraph 3, in relation to the filing of the answering affidavits, kindly note that in order for our clients to comprehensively answer your client's founding affidavits, our clients have a wide range of ANC officials to consult with and possibly get affidavits from. Our clients and the legal team are working as much as they can to have our clients answering affidavits ready as soon as possible. At this stage, our clients do not think that we would be able to file the answering affidavits by Thursday, 20 May, as required in your notice of motion. As you might be aware, the president is out of the country due to a state or government work commitment and is only scheduled to return back to the country on 20 May. He was an official visit to France at the time. And then on the 21st of May, there's another letter in which he says, we write to confirm that we are busy drafting our clients answering papers and are working around the clock to finalize same as soon as possible. We are planning to find, file our clients answering papers by Tuesday, 25 May. And then on the 25th of May, that was the promised deadline. He says, kindly annex the ANC affidavit. We'll file the president's affidavit as soon as we can. And the president's affidavit is filed two days later on the 27th. And you'll remember that the president then asks for condemnation for his failure to deliver, to file on the 25th as promised, and he asked for condemnation for those two days. Now, at the same time, at about the 25th or 27th, the um, uh, case management, judicial case management intervened, and all of these issues were discussed and resolved. I don't even think that the learner judge um, imposed any direction. The parties actually agreed in case management meeting on the timelines for the completion of the case. So any debate about timelines 
were resolved by agreement between the parties. There was nothing at all to seek condemnation for. The president and the ANC did not break any rule at all. And whatever debate there might have been was resolved by case management. My learned friend relies or invokes a case of Republicanse Publicasis, the Afrikaanse Pers Publicasis. It's a judgment of the appellate division, 1972, volume one, SA 773, appellate division at 782. And he says, the judgment says that in an urgent application, the applicant can lay down the deadlines and that the respondent is then bound by them. And it is true that that is what the judgment says, but it makes it quite clear what it means when it says that it is bound, because he said that it's an Afrikaans judgment, but it says that the respondent is obliged to keep to those dates. And then I translate in the sense that he runs the risk of a an order against him by default if he fails to keep to the deadlines. It doesn't mean that the rules change. It just means that a respondent must keep to the to the timelines stipulated by the, the applicant. Otherwise, he runs the risk of a default judgment and then goes on to say. When the case. Um, and such an applicant can provisionally accept the dates. And then when the case comes before the court, he may raise his objections. Well, that's what we plan to do to raise, or that's what we were. I don't think we ever made a plan, but that is what we were would have been entitled to do to say that the four days you allowed us was far too little. And it's uh, we, we refuse to abide by your attempt to force us into a four day response. But it never came to that. We never got to the objection before the court because the issue was resolved by by um, case management. So that the um, suggestion that the president and the ANC should have asked for condemnation is unfounded. And I deliberately dealt with it quite fully because my learned friend insulted the president and the ANC yesterday in making these submissions, accused them of rank arrogance in not seeking condemnation. That is unfounded and it is not an insult uh, deserved by either the president or the ANC. Moods, Maledi, those are our submissions. Afraid, my Lord, you no, sorry. Thank, thank you, Mr. Twingo. Judge Wiener, anything from your side? No, no. Okay. Judge Molokheli? Nothing from my side, uh, Judge Kalopan. Good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Twingo. I think this might be an appropriate time to take the lunch adjournment. It's 10 past 1. Um, can we um, resume at, at 2 p.m.? That's about 45 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Good. Thank That's you. Good. Court will adjourn.
we we want to have some indication with regard to the reply argument and we thought that an hour might not be unreasonable uh, given that both in your and Marcelo's arguments you to some extent dealt with the respondent's case but uh, yeah yeah well yeah. Uh, no I well I don't think it will be sufficient but uh, I, I will try, uh, Justice. Uh, again, of course, it depends on the, I think the method of calculating time must also be taken into account the- Interventions, yeah. Activity okay. and non-activity okay. of the, yeah. I think the yeah. other side, were, in fact, that's where I'm going to start, that they're allowed to get away with so many uh, things that they shouldn't have, but we'll, I'll deal with them in reply, yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank you, um, Justice Colopens. Maybe then just to, <laughs> to make sure that we, we cover everything, if I can just make very brief remarks on the on the on the preliminary points first. The the first one is a, a startling proposition is made that um, the duplication of papers, for example, refer yeah. to uh, matters that are admissible. Mr. Trengov said that if, she, if he puts 10 annexures of the same thing, as long as the first one is admissible, then the other nine are also admissible. I mean, that, that surely cannot be, uh, the, the test of striking out is exactly that. If you put irrelevant or unnecessary matter, uh, then it should be uh, struck out. So it's the first time I hear that you can just attach the same thing a hundred times, as long as the first one is, is um, admissible, then the other 99 must also be taken to be uh, admissible. Then there's the, uh, the issue of the judgment. I mean, this is the one I really was surprised that uh, he, he got away with this one. Uh, well, in, in my experience, to attach a judgment to an affidavit, a full judgment, or a long, long one, uh, like this one of um, the Busasa case, which everybody, including the court, would be able to access if they wanted to, and um, I've never seen, it's like, if imagine if we had attached Ramakatsa, the whole case of Ramakatsa into our founding affidavit, and Ramakatsa 1 and Ramakatsa 2. <clears throat> you don't do that. More so, when that judgment is irrelevant in its own right, the first, first thing is that it's wrong to attach a judgment, but to attach one that is completely irrelevant, whereby his own admission, that judgment is before the Constitutional Court, in other words, in terms of Section 18 of the Superior Courts Act, that judgment, Section 18.1, is inoperational and is suspended because the appeal processes are underway. So it's irrelevant twice, the fact, the fact that it's a judgment, but also the fact that it's suspended. But how can that be allowed and not struck out? And then uh, he puts a, a reports of the public protector, completely irrelevant. To his knowledge, he knows that before the public protector, he was charged as the president of the country. This, uh, the, there's no step aside rule there in Mashamanshov um, or wherever. The step aside rule is at Lutuli House. So what is the public protector thing got to do with this, with what we are busy with here, which is an, uh, an ANC, the invocation of an ANC rule? How that is allowed to to uh, to to pass is is really um, quite strange. Um, and then, of course, we're told that simply because the he might be entitled to refer to his suspension, therefore, ego, he must attach all these hundreds and hundreds of pages 
um, which is, is a non sequitur. The point we make here is that the, remember the affidavit of Ms. Duarte uh, is done on behalf of the president as well. So all we're saying is that what should have happened is that uh, those five or six pages that Ms. Silo um, referred to that, that are in the president's affidavit, um, those amendments should have been made in uh, the, the affidavit of Ms. Duarte, and that's it. And the president would have put a confirmatory affidavit in the usual manner. There was no need for his other 150 pages of duplication and uh, covering uh, the same the same ground. And there, there is um, uh, uh, a case for the court to 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 um, intervene. It's not true that um, the, the the court that parties have a right or a discretion, <laughs> as Mr. Trengov calls it, to just plead in whatever manner they want without taking into account the issues of, of, of word economy, convenience for the court. And um, in a case of this nature, uh, Justice Wiener says it, it doesn't matter that uh, you can have these hundreds of pages unnecessarily, which will be duplicated even on appeal, if there's an appeal, because that's a matter for the appeal courts to worry about. But no, it's a matter for this court to worry about the fact that there are there's unnecessary duplication. Let me just illustrate that point. You know, in the constitutional court, when you do an appeal, you have to make 25 copies. Well, at least pre-COVID, 25 copies of the of your document. Now imagine if we have any party is going to have to make 25 copies of the judgment <laughs> in Busasa, which is suspended. Uh, let's say somebody wanted to do an urgent appeal next week. And that this court must not worry about that kind of of pleading. The uh, in in the the the, the um, SCA in the case of Escom Holdings SOC versus Masinda 2019-5 SA386 SCA described this kind of thing as what it called slovenly practice. And there it was uh, the converse, but the, the principle is the same. And it said that pro, pro, the procedure of adducing evidence by way of hearsay evidence in the main affidavit supported by so-called confirmatory affidavits by the witness who should have provided the necessary details, but who merely sought to confirm what was said uh, in the main affidavit, affidavit in so far as reference has been made to me, was criticized by the Supreme Court of Appeal and described as a slovenly practice. In other words, the principle there is, 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 the, is the exact opposite. Here we're saying that this is the situation where the material should have been in the main affidavit, which, by the way, uh, his name is, is referred to at 003-668. Uh, Ms. Duwata says that her affidavit is also on behalf of the president. So why did he have to give us all this? But anyway, but the most important thing is that the sub-rule on... Um, uh, rule 615 on strikeout is not exhaustive. Those three scandalous, vexatious, and irrelevant are not exhaustive. Anything like this, like the one we see here, should be uh, struck out. And in any event, the retention of the gratuitous manner, uh, 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 matter that involves, um, uh, for example, the um, uh, charges, which is just a, uh, you know gratuitous, is automatically uh, prejudicial to the to the to the person who's complaining about it. And it's, no, it's, uh, it's the first time I hear uh, litigants who come to court and say, no, we made duplications of these papers so many times, four or five times, because we were under pressure. And that's what this court is being told. Under pressure of what? when they even exceeded the time and took two weeks to do an answering affidavit uh, with three senior counsel and, uh, and, and one junior. 
and they were under pressure in two weeks simply to to make sure that the papers are as economical as possible. Anyway, the the um, and then we are told that um, he shouldn't complain about the attachment of his indictment because he's the one who uh, who asked for it because he um, said that uh, the, 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 the charges were frivolous or something like that. But that affirmant where he says that the officials of the ANC met, looked at the charges, and they decided that they were frivolous or flimsy uh, is not denied. That affirmant is not denied. So what is then the need of of uh, trying to embarrass him by putting the the uh, the uh, indictment when the, the real sting of what he's saying is that the officials looked at this thing and they 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 said these charges are flimsy they threw them away and said they were flimsy that's the point he's making and that amendment is not denied what miss duata says is that her lawyers presumably a, a few weeks ago have looked at the Thing and they are saying it's not frivolous. In other words, her lawyers differ with the view of the officials. But so what? Anyway, then we come to the issue of, of condonation. This one takes the cake. The, Mr. Trengov actually says that, that Mr. Um, Mahashule things he can prescribe to the president of the ANC when he must file an affidavit. I mean, and then he denies that that's arrogance and a sense of entitlement. Who cares whether he's the president of the world? Any litigant in front of this court must be treated the same. That's the point I was making yesterday. There's, there's no category of litigants in the uniform rules of court called the president of the ANC. The case that Mr. Trengove has considered says what I said it says is very simple, Republicans uh, uh, and doms. That the in an agent application, the person who prescribes the, um, the, 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 the timelines is the applicant. I even made a concession yesterday that sometimes those um, timelines might be unreasonable. And, uh, but you, you just have to uh, comply. If you don't, then you must explain to the court. I've made it abundantly clear that our complaint is not so much the lateness. That's a different matter. Our complaint is disrespecting a court of law and not even applying for condemnation. As if that's not enough. Actually, that issue is not even addressed in their heads. That's how much respect they have for this court. Even when we raised it in the in the in the replying affidavit to say well, we're now going to ask for costs and you disrespected the court, they think, oh well, you know, the court will obviously know that we are dealing with the president of the ANC here, not some uh, Mickey Mouse uh, litigant, you know. That if that is allowed, really, our courts are going to be reduced to a joke, and that's the point that we we, we want to make. We don't mind, uh, you know, respect being given to people because of their office and what have you. Like, but it must be equal to the respect that's given to all other litigants. There are no different classes of citizens in our courts. There shouldn't be, at least. What we were taught is that justice is blind. And then, Mr. Uh, Tengov actually agreed with me. Because he, say, he says that the case said when his case comes before the, the court, in other words, the, the, the aggrieved uh, litigant, he may raise his objection. But that's exactly the point. The rule, as we know it, is very simple. Comply and complain later. So you comply with the timelines and then you complain later. As, as Mr. Trenkov just said, that's all we're asking them to do, to follow the rule that he has articulated. Not some other rule that says ignore and just carry on as if nothing has happened. 
And then he says, Mr. Tengov, correctly again, that uh, the, the case, the SCA said that if a litigant does not uh, comply, that litigant runs the risk of uh, an order by default. What does that mean? It means if you don't comply with the time rules, your answering affidavit may be regarded as pro non scripto. That's exactly what we said yesterday. That's, that, those are the conditions under which you, your judgment will be given to you by default. In other words, even though you have now put your answering affidavit, uh, but you've put it late, you will be given judgment by default. It will be with. Uh, Mr. Poffin, can I do, hasn't this all been overtaken by the case management that occurred? No, uh, uh, the case <laughs> management before uh, the DJP. Yes. I addressed that yesterday. It can be, unless if uh, the, the, these litigants are prophets. If they knew on the 20th that there'll be case management on the 28th and uh, what it will entail, I made this point that at the time of the default, everyone was still under the impression that the case is going to be on the 1st of June. I made this point many times yesterday. It, it, something cannot overtake prophetically Something that happens in December cannot overtake something that happened in June. It's not possible, humanly possible, logically. So that it was not. Um, and 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 that's the, the the exact point that we 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 were making. And uh, so it, it it really, I mean, I don't. There's no amount of justification that can be found. I'm afraid for uh, this kind of of behavior towards a court of law. There isn't. Not, not at least on the cases uh, that we we have referred to. Anyway, be that as it may, I think with, with the greatest respect, what I'm going to do is coming to the merits. I'm going to convert it a bit and start with uh, the the Ramaphosa suspension, so that we get that out of the way. Uh, and then deal with the with the the, the main point of of um, the the Mahashule, uh, suspension. <clears throat> the starting point is that this court has no business, but no business in arguing the case for Mr. Ramaphosa. Because our complaint is not so much that the the uh, suspension at face value uh, was valid. We start there. There's no doubt about that, and I'm going to come to that. But if you look at prayer 2.3 of the before this court, it is judge, very simple. If I may and it says, I see judge "I'm sorry." In the meeting. Uh, sorry, sorry. There's some interference. Sorry, Mr. Mpofu, no, I think we, we may have, uh, we're not sure if we still have contact with Judge Mulheli, so we oh, just yes. check. Thank you. I do not see him on the list of participants. Um, he disappeared from camera a moment ago as well. All right. Okay, let's see if we can raise him and just see what's happening there. Sorry, Mr. Pika, could you please turn off your camera? If you don't turn off your camera, we'll remove you from the proceedings. Is it me? Yes. Oh, Eric, let me, I'm trying to see.
Okay, Judge Malcheli says he was disconnected from the proceedings, but I suppose it was a connect connection problem. Um, he's going to try to to reconnect, and let's hope he can do so uh, as soon as possible. Sorry, Mr. Mpofu, we're just going to have to bear with us until we, we reconnect again. Yes, um, I'm just putting the stepwatch on silent as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And must I, must I do mine as well for the one hour? Okay, I'll do that as well. Thanks for reminding no. me. <laughs> <laughs> for the first hour, yes. <laughs>
Sorry, Mr. Mpofu, are you? I'm, I'm, are you I'm OK, yes, thank you. I'm, right. I'm back, I'm back. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Uh, just a I was at the point where I was saying that we must just understand what is before this court. F firstly, although we we our starting point is that the Ramaphosa suspension uh, valid and effective, but we qualify that in prayer 2.3. We say suspension of the first respondent, that Mr. Ramaphosa, to be valid and effective until lawfully nullified. So the thrust of that submission is that the you cannot allow a person to ignore uh, uh, an act and resort to self-help. That is the principle around uh, uh, Ode Kral, uh, which, by the way, comes from a common law uh, presumption uh, of uh, omnia uh, presumuntur rite as a actor. That maxim is uh, intended to Sorry, make Jack. sure that uh, it applies even to judicial acts and other acts. It's, it's simply to say that you can't ignore something. For example, if there's a, um, a, a court order, you can't just say, ah, this judge was so wrong. I mean, he didn't even apply. He applied the law of 1921. And therefore, I'm not going to comply with it. You have to take the necessary legal steps to uh, ensure that uh, it is set aside. Otherwise, there would be chaos, as uh, Hookster puts it. Uh, people who just simply resort to self-help and do what they think subjectively is lawful or, 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 or unlawful, and, and basically um, uh, judge their own cases, which, is, which, is, which cannot happen. So the point we're making here has been missed completely, which is that if Mr. Ramaphosa thought that his um, suspension was not valid, he should have taken steps, just like Mr. Makhnashule has done, taken steps, go to court, and say that that uh, suspension must be declared to be unlawful. He does not do so. Even when we raise this matter so sharply in the founding affidavit, they don't do so. But they, the court now spends 20 minutes with Mr. with Miss Malena and Miss Silo. So, yeah, but uh, what about this? What about that? What about that? But on what basis? Let's assume Miss Silo says, okay, I can't answer your questions. Then what is the court going to do? Nothing. Because there's no counter application that has been put here. So even when invited, they still didn't do a counter application to say, uh, declare it declare the suspension letter invalid. So that letter is valid. That suspension is valid. The man is suspended as we speak. <coughs> so what he must do is do what every other person, again, uh, there's no separate laws just because you are a president. He must go to court and set the suspension aside. That's all. That's what the prayer 2.3 invites him to do, like all other citizens. So the, 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 the validity of the, um, of the suspension stems uh, mainly from uh, that non-action and the, the, the uh, resort to self-help, so to speak. Because he just uh, basically just decided, ah, I'm going to throw this thing in the dustbin. It doesn't work like that. But having said that, our starting point, which is the correct starting point that Ms. Malena from Ms. Silo started at, was that in any event that um, even, when, even if he does take it to court, he's not going to succeed because it is valid. But that's not a matter that the court must worry itself about. It's that court where he will be challenging it that uh, will worry as to whether he wins or loses. This is not about that. But we're simply emphasizing the fact that even if he does that, he will lose anyway. Why? Because the suspension is valid and it was properly authorized. Which takes us to this so-called contradiction 
between invoking 25.70 uh, uh, in respect of Mr. Uh, or, or rather Mr. Mahashule criticizing 25.70 and then um, invoking it. That's the, you know, the favorite um, uh, uh, issue that is raised by all sorts of people in the media and uh, so-called professors. So the, it's, there's no contradiction. Here's the issue. We are saying, we've said in our reply, in the, our reply of affidavit, 2570 is unconstitutional. And we gave the reasons why. But we say in the reply, obviously, if we are right in that contention that 25.70 is uh, unconstitutional, then insofar as Mr. Mahashule may have relied on 2570, reluctantly or otherwise, uh, doesn't matter if he, he did so reluctantly as he claims, then obviously that reliance on 25.70, if we are right that it is unconstitutional, will nullify both his letter and the Ramaphosa letter. And that would be the end of the matter, and that would be a contradiction indeed, if all that Mr. Mahashule relied on was 2570. But he did not. Ms. Selo took this court chapter and verse onto the letter that makes it clear that Mr. Mahashule actually relied on the Nasrak resolution Mr. Krengov has also considered that he relied on 16.6.1. Mr. Trengov has now changed from attacking the um, mandate that was given to Mr. Mahashule uh, by the NEC uh, to protect the organization and so on as valid because they invoked it against the Shazi applicants. So three instruments apart from 2570, and we are saying, assume for, for, for the purposes of this uh, uh, debate that the 2570 leg is out because it's a so-called contradiction. What of the, 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 the remaining ground on which he, grounds on which he relied, which are, uh, are, are premised on the 16.6, the Nasrak resolution, and the uh, uh, mandate? So for that, you don't need the Latib principle per se, because as Mr. Trengov correctly points out, the Latib principle is if you've relied wrongly on the, on, on, on the incorrect um, uh, statute, and then it turns out that by some chance there was another statute which you, you did not rely on, which, which could help you, then you can't apply the rule there. But here we have the other statute, quote unquote, is, has been invoked, not in the replying affidavit as Mr. Trengov wants you to believe. It's invoked in the founding affidavit because the letter I'm telling you about, the suspension letter of Mr. Ramaphosa is in the replying affidavit, or rather, is in the founding affidavit, right? We could not know prophetically again that in the answering affidavit, they're going to come and say, no, Mr. Mahashule is not... Um, 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 okay. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. I was told that my, I was off uh, the, the camera. <coughs> okay. So the, 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 the point I, I really want to make is that uh, the Mr. Mahashule, or, or rather, uh, the, the, or, and his legal team, had to respond to, the, to what is raised in the answering affidavit. Uh, and that is what, in that context that we, we invoked, for example, the Latib uh, principle and pointed out to the fact that in any event, on top of 16.6.1, there was also uh, the other general mandate, which was denied and now has been considered. So that's the issue. It can be that, let's say, 
um, the, the NPA charges me for, uh, 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 I don't know, reckless driving. And then they rely on the, the current act on reckless driving. And they also rely on another one that was repealed in 1985. And then I can show that the one that was repealed in 1985 definitely doesn't appeal. So on this logic, I must then be acquitted even on the on the one that is applicable, the one that was passed properly uh, uh, last month. I mean, what is that? The, 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 the issue is that the, that letter is valid also for the purposes, for, from the point of view of the other statute that was uh, relied on, quote unquote, which is uh, the cluster that I've, I've, I've spoken about. So there's there's no contradiction. The contradiction is 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 it, it might appear in the newspapers very nicely uh, because it it, it is um, apparent there to those kinds of people, but here this is a court of law. Um, it, it, we we have to accept that uh, he relied not only on on 25 uh, 70 because he says so in, in his letter. He doesn't say so as some kind of afterthought. Mm -hmm. And in any event, even if it was correct that it was not said in the founding of David, which is not true, I've just uh, explained, that would not preclude the court because the, the, the Constitutional Court has held in Mapajo uh, versus um, AENGUS -E Lifestyles, 2012 bracket 3 SA 531 CC. And I might add that this principle has also been confirmed recently in a case that is in the May reports of this year, 2021, I think bracket two, it's Amabungane. I will get the, the, the proper citation. What, what's uh, the, the Mampango one? What's the page, page? 531 CC. Thank you. And uh, the Amabungane case is in the May reports of this year at uh, page 246. Um, and that, it, in both of those cases, the principle was asserted that um, the, the rule in terms of which a court pursues, a, a, yeah, permits a party to raise a point of law is subject to well-known conditions. These conditions ensure fairness to all parties First, the point sought to be raised must be a point of law in the true sense of the word. Second, uh, if not foreshadowed in the pleadings, it must be supported by the established facts on the record. That was at paragraph 109 of Mapaku. So the point we are making is that, let's assume for, for a minute that that, that, that that point was not uh, uh, pleaded. Is it supported by the facts? Yes, because it appears from the letter. The SG says that he asserted uh, uh, the letter speaks for itself, where he invokes the uh, Nasrak resolution and, uh, and, and and he even quotes quotes from it. So even if it was true, the, the, then uh, that line of cases, uh, including the, the most recent one of Amabungane, would have uh, covered the point. So please, at least let's accept one thing, that the, the, the contradiction is, is, is manufactured. The point we make about that is, is uh, well, it comes back to, the, to this point. Mr. Ramaphosa says that uh, he was not found guilty by the Integrity Commission uh, of any criminality. But as Ms. Malen from Ms. Silo pointed out, in the NWC minutes, it is said that guilt is, or innocence is not a requirement. So that's a futile exercise to tell the court that he was not found guilty of any criminality. He also says that he was not, um, uh, uh, that the grounds were not told. That's not true because he was told the grounds. The grounds might be good or bad, but he was told that uh, his matter is before the courts and uh, that it's before the hawk, hawks and, and what have you, and that he used money. But in any event, he confessed. He has confessed under oath in, in front of the um, Zondo Commission as well as in the papers, he has not denied when it, it is said that he used at least 300 million. Those are his own words. The 
proper version, according to some people, is a billion rand. But again, it doesn't matter if it's a billion or, or 300 million or 900 million, because the documents are sealed anyway. One day we will find out. But the point of the matter is that he used money on his own account. How can a court then say, well, is he hit by the rule? Because that's the only issue that the court must, must, must this court at least, must concern. Is he hit by the step aside rule? Yes because he used 300 million rand to buy votes or to do whatever he did with the uh, CR17 uh, campaign. And the fact that the public protector found that that is, that, or rather the court found that she, the public protector might not have jurisdiction because ironically, the court, Mr. Ramaphosa's defense in that case that he now wants to parade here was that the public protector does not have jurisdiction because this is an ANC internal matter. Well, now we are in the ANC, so he must face the music. He could, if, if according to him, he couldn't face the music in front of the public protector because this was an ANC matter. He, now, this is the Secretary General of the ANC who is now saying that uh, the, the, this is unacceptable. Even the Integrity Commission has said that such conduct is against the values of the ANC. So there's no doubt about the, the wrongdoing. And, and there's no doubt about the power, because really, the only um, uh, um, defense that is raised is that there was no authority. And we've shown that there was authority. The man was um, uh, not yet uh, suspended. So you can't even use the suspension, because the letter was written on the 3rd of, of, uh, of June, or rather of May. This is not denied. This is common cause. It's also common cause that his letter of suspension was given to him on the 5th. So even if we forget about all the other complaints we have, the, at that time, he was a, the Secretary General. He had been invited by the ANC to an NWC meeting. He, he, he had been invited to a meeting of the officials as the Secretary General. So he had all the power to suspend Mr. Ramaphosa. The only possible defense would have been this so-called retaliation thing, which the media likes. Everybody, despite the fact that Mr. Mahashule has said under oath that his letter was written first, the media of South Africa continues to say that his was a retaliation. How do you retaliate to something that has not happened? And the we point, get... The point you just made there, Mr. Mpofu, uh, is that... Uh, the retaliation is not only linked to the dates on the letters, but that uh, throughout the process, he was attending the meetings, he knew that the NEC was uh, intending to suspend or had decided to suspend. No, he did not know that. I mean, the, the, that then goes against everything we've said yesterday. He, how could he have known that when he was going to be, he was entitled to Audi on Saturday? He's not a prophet, once again. So, Let's assume he was going to get his Audi on Saturday and uh, on the 8th, and then uh, con the Audi is not a, you know, just for decoration. He could have um, uh, convinced them that he should, he should not be suspended. And then what? W what was the retaliation for then? So that theory is also is, is even actually worse than the first one. Because the first one, remember, is, de is debunked by the, the pure fabrication made by Ms. Duarte. And that's why it has been abandoned. Because she says, I mean, anybody who believes this will believe anything. She says she wrote the letter on the third, or rather she drafted it, prepared it on the third. She does not remember when she signed it. Imagine. And then on the, I'm sorry, sorry, Justice. No, sorry, sorry, Mr. Mpuva, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that point has already, in a sense, the respondent have considered to it that the letters, they're not relying on the contradiction. So maybe we should move. I think you, you did make the point earlier in your submissions about those letters. The only point that remained was that they were saying she knew that the suspension was coming, and you've answered that, that particular point. Yes, no, but I was also trying to show you why the, there's uh, flip-flopping on that point, but that's fine. I'm, I'm telling you that they're running away from the fact that Ms. Duarte 
tells you that she, if she doesn't remember, it's the first time in 110 years that uh, a Secretary General is being suspended. And she says she can't remember when she signed the letter. I mean, anyway, that's fine. I'll, 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 I'll move to, 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 to the, the next point. <clears throat> so the, this court has to grant prayer 2.3. That's really the, the, the point I'm making, which is that it's, it's, if it's valid at all or at the at worst, it's valid until it is challenged uh, in, a, in, a, in a court of law, which is really all, all we're asking for. It can be that some people are just allowed to be judges in their own uh, cases. Then, of course, Mr. Justice Polapen said to um, Mr. Trangov made a, 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 a mistake. I'm now dealing with the issue of the withdrawal of the, um, uh, the withdrawal and apology issue. Mr. Trangov goes to one letter and then goes to the other and Justice Colopin said, no, they are, they are fine, Mr. Trangov, they are, they are, it's the same. It doesn't matter which one you go to. Well, I just thought I was feeling sorry for Justice Colopin because I also thought that for a long time. Those letters are not the same. So this new defense now that says uh, it's a request has been manufactured, um, you know. So not only do they repurpose resolutions, they also repurpose le their own letters. Look at the letter at 001-125. my lord. Thank you. And then look at the other one at 003-454. The letter that was sent to 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 Mr. Mahashule says says that the NEC meeting discuss your so-called letter of suspension for which you had no authority or mandate from any structure of the movement. We've dealt with that. He had, a, he had authority from the national conference. The NEC agreed that the, such conduct was completely unacceptable and so on. The NEC furthermore instructed the national officials to advise you. And we are told, no, it's not an instruction, it's a, it's a request. And then uh, to withdraw your purported letter of suspension, accordingly, you are hereby requested to withdraw uh, the letter in 48 hours. Look at the one that Ms. Duarte uh, attached, purporting to be the, this same letter, dated uh, on the same day, 12th March. This one is, is signed by her on the 12th, of, of May 2021. The other one is signed uh, by her as well. I mean, this is bizarre. Then in the, in the, the, the word request then appears at paragraph two of the other letter, of the false letter. It says, it says the NEC directed the national officials to request you to withdraw uh, your purported letter of suspension and to apologize publicly on the directive of the national uh, officials, you are requested to withdraw your purported letter and to apologize publicly and so on. So it's a completely different, it's actually, we did, we did, this letter was not sent to uh, Comrade uh, Mahashule. The first one says, dear Comrade Mahashule, this one says, dear Comrade SG. Uh, these are just some, it's one of those things, like you can give it to children and say, spot the difference. <laughs> and they will spot the differences. There'll be about 20 of them and they will win the prize. That the, the, the false letter uh, of the so-called request is put here. I mean, where are we going to, going to go with this if a court of law is not just being dis disrespected? Let's assume for argument's sake that Ms. Duarte had written both of those letters because she has signed both of them. Same person. Then she would have had a duty at the very least to say to the court, I wrote this letter, I sent it. And then two hours later, I thought, no, no, it's not properly worded. Let me do another one. She would have had a duty to explain to the, you can't just sneak it in the affidavit and hope that Justice Colopin, like and me will not notice the difference. 
because I only noticed the difference, as I say, um, probably yesterday. And that is uh, the kind of, 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 of uh, people we're dealing with here. Apart from which, by the way, there was a, a, a debate here about, uh, about um, anyway, no, let, let me not go to that suspension yet. Let me finish off this point. That the suspension, the so-called withdrawal, apart from it being fraudulent, the, the, the request for uh, withdrawal, uh, is in any event dependent on the unlawfulness of the, of the, of the uh, Ramaphosa suspension which we have established. So he had nothing to apologize for. If anybody needs to apologize, it is uh, Mr. Ramaphosa and Ms. Duarte for uh, this letter, this repurposed uh, letter. <coughs> and, uh, the, and anyone who said that Mr. Mahashule has been found guilty, guilty in his absence. They say he's found guilty and is sentenced to an apology without him being there after he's been booted out. And he must apologize in 14 eight hours, otherwise he's going to be taken to a disciplinary hearing. <laughs> That's the request. Really. Now, the 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 the, the it's 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 very clear that um, what was being done here was to bulldoze uh, Mr. Mahashula on the one hand. On the other hand, to come with this notion that is only known in the worst dictatorships in the world that you by the, even the thought of suspending the president you are insulting him and therefore it must just be thrown out it's called insult laws in the dictatorships of the world where it's a crime to even uh, um, insult the president quote unquote and that's what was at play here so that was endorsed, the fact that he, 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 he may not. When the law is very clear, or the rules of the ANC are very clear, that any member, the conference said every CADA who is accused of, and so on, and so on, every, there's no exemptions. If you are a branch member somewhere in um, Pumalanga or the Eastern Cape or whatever, you must be treated in the same way as the president or the SG of the, of the, of the organization. So let's go to the to the so 2.4 must be granted prayer our prayer 2.4 must be granted which says the the instruction the first 2.3 is the suspension of the first respondent Mr Ramaphosa valid and effective until lawfully nullified 2.4 the instruction announced by the the first second and third respondents for the applicant to apologize for issuing the suspension letter to the first respondent to be unlawful and unenforceable and we can add now fraudulent <coughs> executed. So 2.3 and 2.4 uh, must be granted. Let's go then back to 2.1, prayers 2.1 and 2.2. Now here, Mr. Trengo, as I was saying, was allowed to get away with really a statement that I, I found I, I were perplexing, including ascribing to me things that I did not say. He dealt with this question of the contradiction that uh, uh, um, I've already dealt with. Then he says, and the record will show this, when he was talking about the Prince Law case, Mr. Trengov, verbatim, I wrote it down so that I can quote it verbatim. These are not even civil proceedings. These are disciplinary proceedings, says Mr. Trengov. The same person who whose case is premised on saying that these are not disciplinary proceedings, um, says that they are, not, they are not even civil proceedings, they are disciplinary proceedings. And then once this court to then say, no, you cannot apply Audi because these are not disciplinary proceedings. And uh, as I say, just get away with it. But it's a much more serious problem than that. Mr. Trengove, let's look at it legally. Mr. Trengove comes to this court. He says two things. One, he says he relies on the uh, jockey club cases. He accepts that the jockey club cases bind his client. 
Now, that is a confession of note. Because why would the Jockey Club cases bind him? What do the Jockey Club cases say? They say, if you are a member of a Jockey Club or a voluntary association, and that association wants to take disciplinary proceedings against you, then uh, Audi has to be applied, even if it is not uh, specified in writing. It must be implied. So by accepting the Job Key Club's uh, principle, it means he accepts that we are dealing with disciplinary proceedings here. Because the, 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 the Audi principle that comes from the Jockey Club cases can only be uh, invoked if the, it's disciplinary and punitive uh, proceedings. But Mr. Tenkov goes further. He says in, a, in, a, in another, we accept that Audi applies. So forget about the Jockey Club cases, forget about what he said, because he might say, uh, when I quote him, maybe it was a slip of the tongue when he said, these are not civil proceedings, these are disciplinary proceedings. But I'm saying it was not, it was correct. And uh, we agree with him. And we don't look a gift horse in the mouth. We agree that uh, the Audi applies. We agree, agree that these are uh, disciplinary proceedings. And we agree that uh, the Jockey Club uh, cases apply exactly because they are disciplinary proceedings. But in any event, I do not know anybody who can entertain this argument that these are not disciplinary proceedings. Why did the ANC put this clause 25.70 under uh, the heading of 20, uh, Rule 25? Rule 25 has got a big heading that says disciplinary um, Rule 25. And then if, as if that is not enough, <laughs> Rule 25 has got a subsection that is called um, uh, suspensions, I think. Uh, so it, at Rule 25 of the ANC, everyone knows, it says management of organizational discipline. And I'm sure the, the National Conference people were, they, they knew what they were doing. They could have put this rule, if it was some rule about uh, whatever we were told, so, some mumbo jumbo thing about you no, know, just protecting uh, values and so on. Then they would have put it maybe at, as rule 50 or whatever. But the mere fact that they located at, at rule 25 means that they knew that it is a, a disciplinary rule. Not only that, 2570 is under um, the heading. There are so many temporary suspension. There's a subheading. There's a big heading, management of organizational discipline, then temporary suspension. And if you, anybody who can interpret any instrument will tell you what happened is that the reason why there were 69 of those rules, 25.69. And then they added 25.70 because this was now the latest rule. So Mr. <coughs> Trenkov says in his head, it is wrong to say that uh, 25.70 is, is, um, is inconsistent with the, with the rest of the constitution of the ANC. And he says, even if we are right in that uh, contention, then it must be construed. The rule, the real rule is that it must be construed in harmony with the rest. So we say we agree. So therefore it must be construed in harmony with the rest of the management of organizational discipline and temporary suspension. So whichever way you look at it, it's a disciplinary, there's no way you can escape the application of Audi uh, in, in, in this, in, in, in this uh, instance. And that's why they had to try that, that thing about um, it's a private contract. But even if it's a private contract, it's a private contract of a voluntary association in which the jockey club cases apply. So there's no, there's no way out, I'm afraid, uh, of, of that. Um, and Mr. Trengov said, we accept that the invocation of Rule 2570 attracts a fair hearing. OK, I've already dealt with that. Um, but then he says, this is the answer to all this, all these concessions. We, we know that Audi applies, but we're saying he got Audi. That's, that's really the high watermark of his submission. 
But where? Where did he get Audi? No, then he tells us about some conversations that took place, uh, you know, in February somewhere and so on. But what is Audi? For, for, for that to, to work, Mr. Trengove has to come up with this uh, new uh, definition of Audi. He says, all that is required, all that Audi requires is an opportunity to speak. Well, I studied Latin. Audi, alteram partem. Audi, audum, Audi means to hear. To hear. It's a right to be heard. Of course, you must speak first, but the right, the content of the right is to be heard. Audi, alteram partem. Hear the other side. While you are hearing the other side, you keep quiet and you hear the other side. That's what Audi means. There's no such thing as all Audi requires is an opportunity to speak. So as if you can just speak in your own bedroom and then uh, uh, you say you've satisfied Audi. No. The, 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 um, and the right to speak, by the way, goes further. It's not the right to speak to any person in a taxi rank. It's the right to speak to the decision maker. The person who's making the decision, and that much at least Mr. Trengov, to his credit, uh, considered. So who is the decision maker in terms of 2570? It's the Secretary General. The other decision maker is the NWC to, for the authority, the point that Justice Mulathe made uh, yesterday. But the, the, the real decision maker is the Secretary General. And let me put something to bed before. It is not true that Mr. what Mr. Trengov ascribes to us, or to Mr. Mahashule for that matter, that Mr. Mahashule's case is as ridiculous as this, that Mr. Mahashule says he's the only pe person who can suspend himself. That has never been our case. It will never be, it has never been Mr. Mahashule's case. Mr. Mahashule's case is that the person who did suspend him, namely, Ms. Duarte was not authorized. So the question is not whether Mr. Mahashule can suspend himself. We all know the answer to that. He can't. The question is who is, is, is authorized. And we know in the case of the officials that they, because of the same conflict, they assigned the powers to the Treasurer General. So it's not God given that those powers would be ascribed to the Deputy Secretary General or that they would fall on her as she, as she claims. And that's the point. Uh, the, that's the point here. So we, we must never be accused of, of having made uh, that uh, outrageous uh, uh, proposal that Mr. Mahashule wanted to, to suspend himself. He knows that he, he, he can't do that, but it, uh, that can never preclude him from challenging the authority of the person who did uh, uh, exercise uh, the power. So then the, the so the point really that we're making is that the only Audi that is worth its salt would be Audi before the decision maker. Who, in other words, the, the, the person who would have been designated to come in his stead in view of his uh, uh, conflict if that happened. And and so and so the, the, the deputy secretary would be disqualified to be the person to come instead of the Secretary General? Uh, well, uh, I won't put it as strongly as that, uh, 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 Justice Mulathe. All I'm saying is that she was not the person authorized <laughs> to, 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 it could have been, they could have said it must be the Deputy President, they could have said, no, it must be the President himself, they could have said it must be the Treasurer General or the National Chairperson. And I suspect that is why they, 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 they chose those, um, but because, Apart from anything else, just common logic will tell you that she can't be given power to suspend her, her senior. Uh, you know, so she, she was the unlikeliest person to be to be uh, assigned those powers. But I, I'm not saying it could have been given that power to anybody. It could have been, been given to a, a member of a branch or whatever. But it was not given to uh, the deputy secretary general. But the, the related point, Justice Mulathe, is that you made the point that 
well, th there might be flexibility around Audi. But whatever flexibility might be around Audi, it must still be before the decision maker. In other words, that Audi would have been in front of member of ANCX. We don't know who it is who would have been assigned that, uh, that power. But le let's be kind. Let's say it was the DSG. Let's say she was authorized uh, properly. Then that Audi would have had to be in front of her. And there is no Audi that was ever exercised in front of her, even. So, and then of course, we were told that, um, I, I said this apparently, that the, the only invocation of section 19 that we rely on is, is the absence of a hearing. Well, let me tell you, I did not say anything of the sort. And I will never say anything of the sort. The, what we said is that there are three grounds upon which the uh, 2570 is unconstitutional. One, it is the, that it does not provide Audi. And I will show you now that actually that's not the strongest ground because as Justice Mullah uh, uh, correctly pointed out, the, the, there's an escape route uh, uh, of that one. You can say, well, let's let's construe the the, um, the clause in terms of the jockey club cases as if it requires Audi, which is what I've already explained. We know that they fail on that leg anyway. But so that that is not um, the the other leg. We said that it offends the uh, presumption of innocence. And the third leg, we said it offends the right under Section 34, the right of appeal. So this notion that we said we're pegging our Section 19 complaint only on uh, Audi is wrong. Is is just misrepresenting our argument, uh, you know, uh, gratuitously. So and as far as so the Audi issue again, let's be kind and say the Audi issue can be uh, escaped through the Jockey Club cases. Then what is the answer that you were given to the the lack of right of appeal? Nothing you are not given an answer. So it's unconstitutional on that ground alone. But what is the answer that you are given in relation to the presumption of innocence? It is that, no, the presumption of innocence only applies to accused persons in a criminal uh, setting. Well, that is completely untrue. The, our courts have said, there's a case that just happened now that in front of everybody called uh, the, for shorthand, I'll call it state capture uh, commission versus Jacob Zuma, which uh, just happened, uh, uh, it was reported recently. In that case, one of the of these parties, uh, I think it was Kasak, um sought to argue this this the, uh, point that um, um, the the rights the rights in section thirty five only apply in a criminal setting. The Constitutional Court rejected that notion and said that the, 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 those rights, including the right to self-incrimination, which is found in section, or rather the privilege against self-incrimination, which is found in uh, section 35, like the, the right, uh, 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 the presumption of innocence, can be invoked outside of the criminal setting. And <coughs> those uh, rights, can be invoked. We know, and this is not something new, by the way. Our our court has said long before, in the case of uh, Ferreira versus Levine, that uh, the rights the the right the the, the, the rights against uh, the uh, self incrimination or the presumption against self incrimination can be invoked in um, section forty four one seven proceedings. Um, in other words, in, in uh, liquidation proceedings, which are not criminal proceedings. But even in the uh, state capture versus Zuma case, it was confirmed that the right to self-incrimination, the privilege against self-incrimination can be invoked at the Zondo Commission, which is not a criminal uh, setting. All that was said was that 
the in that particular case, Section 3.4 of the of the Commission's Act allows for the invocation of this right. So in other words, there is an instrument in the Zondo Commission that allows for the invocation of the, right, the privilege against self-incrimination. Similarly, we have shown you that in Appendix 3 of the ANC Constitution, there is a provision that, uh, that uh, gives every member of the ANC the right against the, presu uh, the presumption of innocence. So it's exactly the same setting. In the Zondo Commission situation, it was Section 3.4, here, we know it's not a statute, but it's a, it's a provision, an internal provision. So even if it wasn't there, by the way, the, the contractual provision against uh, uh, presumption of, of innocence itself would have been sufficient. But what so, I'm saying is that- so can, is, I, can, I, can I just ask you this question, that to the extent that you will find it in the provisions relating to disciplinary proceedings, yes. um, is it your contention that it would apply in the course of a disciplinary proceeding, which which I think must be self-evident, that when a disciplinary proceeding is conducted, the presumption of innocence would kick in, but that it would also apply in the context of a suspension, uh, whether it's a disciplinary or preventative, whatever, but yes. the, presum the presumption of innocence, what would, it, what would its effect then be, not in a disciplinary hearing, Mm. but in the context of a suspension. Yes. Uh, would, it stand, okay, would it stand in the way of a suspension as an immutable uh, barrier? No, no, this is how it would apply, uh, Justice Colopin. If, if l l l l let's say, um, put it this way, uh, let's start at the back, uh, as you have said. In other words, if, 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 because of the presumption, you may not charge me for X, let's say, okay? In other words, you may not invoke charge X because of the presumption of innocence. Then, a fortiori, you may not suspend me pending the, the disciplinary hearing uh, in respect of charge X. In other words, the presumption would nullify, in that example I'm giving, it would nullify both the hearing, as you correctly say, but it also could not then justify a, 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 a non-competent suspension, so to speak, because the suspension must speak to the charge. You can't say I'm suspending you now uh, for six months, but the charge actually is something for which you, you will be sentenced for, to two weeks. Yeah, uh, uh, yes. So so it, it nullifies both. Uh, because we know here, the, uh, that's the first answer, Justice Colopin. Uh, the second answer, of course, is that the, the, the escape route of that these are not disciplinary proceedings. I've, I've already closed that. So we know that we are dealing with uh, the, a, a situation where um, Appendix 3 is... Um, applicable. And by the way, Appendix 3 doesn't talk about a hearing uh, as, as if it only applies to the hearing. It says, the objective of disciplinary procedure is to ensure that in all disciplinary proceedings, that includes that in that in the context that we are discussing, that must include the charging, the suspension, and so on, the mitigation, the, 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 the entire process. So the, the 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 only way out of this would be to say that this is not these are not disciplinary proceedings, which is is as we say is, is just outlandish okay. because it's in section twenty five and um, and neither does the case of long uh, uh, assist uh, our learned friends. The case of long is not applicable to this situation because the case of long actually sinks them uh, even further. Because if we accept that this is, these are disciplinary proceedings, that case says, uh, as the Labour Court correctly stated, the suspension imposed on the applicant was a precautionary measure, not a disciplinary one. So that already means that if it's, if it's a disciplinary one, as we say, that case is out. But even if that was not so, Long says, uh, consequently, the requirements relating to fair disciplinary action under the LRA cannot find application. This is not the Labor Relations Act. I think Justice Colopin picked up this point that 
the the Audi we're talking about here, not only is it not from the LRA, but it's the general standard of fairness. Audi as in fairness. And so and and this in long they said, if you look at paragraph 23 of long, this case concerns fair labor practices in terms of section 23 of the constitution. That locates it uh, in, into uh, Justice Mulafehi's old uh, terrain. Section 23 of the Constitution deals specifically with labor rights. But the fairness we're talking about here is not that one of Section 23. It is fairness from Section 9. It is the fairness that the ANC had in mind when it said this rule, step aside, must be applied evenly, consistently, even-handedly. It is that fairness. It was not, th the, when the ANC said that, it was not thinking about the LRA. It was thinking about fairness per se. It is the same, the fairness that you find in the, in the sections on dignity. It is the fairness that you find in section 34 of the constitution. It is fairness generally. It, so this idea, it's, it's usually made in the context of PAJA because people think fairness can only be located in PAJA. But PAJA fairness is only section 33 of the constitution. But the constitution has got fairness throughout, including 217, the fairness in tenders and, and procurement and so on. So it's, there's not the, the yeah. so the fairness we're, we're invoking has got absolutely nothing to do with the long case okay. and the uh, uh, all those things we were Mr. Told. Mr. Mpofu, you you did you did reactivate your stopwatch. Uh, <laughs> did you? Not? Oh no! Well, now that you are reminding me, I'll re I'll reactivate. I'm it. just I'm just looking at it now. You, you, no, I, I I I take the point. I think you 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 probably have are you you probably close to closure now, correct? If yes, I'm, I'm yes I'm 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 coming close. Yeah. And I just want to say something about this um uh the, this idea, you know, of of the, the denial of Audi is one thing, uh, my lords and my lady. But for somebody to be literally booted out at the opportunity of, of exercising Audi, I mean, that's, that's aggravation. What would, have, what would have it taken out of the ANC to say, based on what Justice Weiner said and, and Mr. Trenko uh, confirmed, that the, at that stage, the, the DSG was the de facto SG on their version thought that the suspension is suspended. So in the morning of the 8th, when the suspension was suspended, what would have it taken from them to say, SG, you have, there's this letter, we don't know, and we've also got your letter of review. Uh, what do you have to say about it? Even, even if they knew because of their dominant numbers that they are going to overrule him, but Mr. Mpofu, with respect, that, that wouldn't have made a difference, isn't it? Because let's assume that they heard him on that day yeah, and they confirmed his uh, suspension. You, you would have still been able to come to this court and argue, as you're doing now, that the Audi should have been when the decision was taken and the decision maker was not the NEC, but the SG or whoever was designated. And if Audi failed there, you couldn't fix it up later. Yeah, no, Justice Colopan, I thought we had gone through this yeah. yesterday, that there are two Audis. The, uh, yes, you are right in respect of the Audi number one. Mm -hmm. I'm now addressing the, 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 the Audi on the, on the review. Okay. But okay. If, if you think about it, it actually even covers Audi number one. Because remember, on our version, the real decision maker was the NEC. And at least even on the version of the integrity committee. Remember, the integrity commission said this matter must be referred to the NEC. Yes. So even in terms of Audi number one, they could have said, we're giving you two Audis. One is why must we not suspend you per se? Even if you had not uh, submitted any review. But now that you have submitted the review, why must we not hear you in that respect? Okay. For 20 minutes, token, token Audi. They could have uh, given. They don't even do that, uh, my lords and my lady. They just simply say, "No, go away." And they, they tell you they want to come here and moralize and tell you that this was because they want to uphold the values of the ANC. 
but seated in that room of the people who were, who were putting out uh, Mr. Mahashule was were many people that, according to Mr. Lechwete, had uh, uh, their own uh, corruption issues uh, or at least uh, uh, accusations. Seated in that room was uh, Mr. Jacob Zuma, who is charged, everybody knows, charged with all sorts of an array of charges. And uh, he has to be part of this group, this um, uh, upright group that is um, uh, putting out Mr. Mahashula before his Audi is exercised. Be why? Because, and Mr. Mahashula's suspension at that stage on their version is suspended. I mean, a, a bigger injustice cannot be imagined. And we completely reject and poo poo this idea that it was driven by morality was driven by factionalism. That's what it was. Now, the, 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 the point about Mr. Trenkov, where I agree with him, is that he accepts that uh, the NEC does not have the power to alter, vary, um, uh, or, or uh, amend the Nazarak resolution. So at least that's a, a major breakthrough. Now, but at the back of that concession is, is then a factual inquiry. It's a, it makes the life of this court very easy because now we have a concession that the it was unlawful to, to amend. So the only question is, was, the, was it amended or not? If it was amended, then we're home and dry. Then uh, prayers 2.1 and 2.4 must be granted. So that narrow issue is a very simple one to deal with. Was there an amendment or not? Well, unless if the word amendment is, has a new meaning, we demonstrated yesterday that the, the, so, the, the, the new repurpose rule is so fundamentally different and takes away crucial elements and crucial people, by the way, from uh, it's the ambit of the National Conference Resolution. Because it somehow, uh, under the so-called categories, we do not have the category of the people who used uh, money to buy conferences, such as Mr. Ramaphos. And we do not have uh, the category of people who are subject of uh, the investigative processes, such as uh, Mr. Ramaphosa and others. And as demonstrated by the list that we have at RA9, which is 004-127, that is the best illustration of the, the real uh, purpose of the, of the re repurposing, uh, if the pan is excused. At 004-131, you see there's a list of people that the Integrity Commission had said should, not be, should be excluded from the people who must go to parliament. And among that list, you have uh, people like Gwede Bantashe, um, Mr. Zizi Kodwa, there's even uh, Mr. David Mabuza, um, Mr. Cedric Frolik, Mr. Tabang Makwetla, Deputy Minister Makwetla, sorry, and so on. So some of these people are ministers of state and deputy ministers today. Why? Because although the Integrity Commission had correctly identified them as falling under the NASREC resolution, they, uh, as, as recently as the last election, which is in 2019, boom, in 2020, they no longer uh, uh, are covered, because, including Mr. Ramaphosa, because now the, the, the new rule uh, only targets those who have been uh, uh, for, for, formally charged. So the, 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 this exercise, I'm afraid, Sorry, is Mr. not... Mr. Mpoku, yes. I don't want to uh, prolong this, but there were two, there were two categories. So it didn't take out the one category completely. It just put in a different guideline in respect of that other category of people who had not yet been charged. Yeah, yes. No, but uh, let's start. Uh, uh, as long as you accept, Justice Weiner, the, the, the first proposition, I'm going to address your question, the proposition about the exclusions. And I'm saying if there are exclusions, let's assume there were 20 categories 
I'm saying if, if, the, if the national conference had put 21, then let's at least accept that there's a, and there was an exclusion. And if there is an exclusion, is that an amendment or not? That's the only simple question I'm addressing now. And I submit that it is. But now let's come to your to 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 the issue of um, uh, the categories, the, the alleged categories. What you say, you must go to 008-29 of the, the, that is uh, our heads, where we, where we quote the actual um, uh, resolution. It says, the, this is what uh, Nazarek says, demand that every cadre, not one who's a president or whatever, every cadre accused of or reported to be involved in corrupt practices, account to the integrity committee immediately or faces DC processes or be summarily suspended, uh, or rather that they, they summarily suspend people who fall, fail to give an ex acceptable uh, explanation while they face disciplinary or investigative or prosecutorial procedures. That's the, and then the so-called guidelines. And by the way, it's, it's also not true that our attack is on the, on the guidelines. Our attack is on the NEC resolution. So it's no use for the other side to shift our case and, and then attack that case, which they've made for themselves. We, we, the, our case is that the, the, it's on the NEC resolution. The guidelines, we couldn't attack the guidelines. The guidelines make the matter even worse. They were not even finished. There was, uh, uh, Mr. Mashatilo was still going to present some of the guidelines on the 8th of, how could we attack something that did not even exist uh, in, in full form? So we're attacking the decision. We're not attacking the guidelines. That's another uh, uh, misallocation of our case. But anyway, the, at 3.4.13 of the guidelines, it says, which is at 003-333, the consideration that the Secretary General uh, takes into account as to whether to refer the matter to the Integrity Commission. So from it being referred immediately, <coughs> it must now, uh, there's a question of whether. And then in that whether, it says uh, at 3.4.1.3E, the balance of interest of the matter in the in the um, of the member and the organization in either having the matter uh, dealt in front of the integrity commission immediately or be delayed. So there's now an option of it being delayed. But here's the best one, and we must also take into account the role and standing of the member of the organization in the organization or the state. <laughs> the role and standing of the member in the organization or the state must now be taken into account as to whether you step aside. What did Nazarek say? Every cadre, every one, literally, from the president downwards. If that is not an amendment, then I don't know what an amendment means. If it is not an amendment also to, to, put a, 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 to exclude the investigative people, uh, then I don't know what an amendment is. If it's not an amendment to include those who use money, then we don't know what an amendment is. And it doesn't help to say, no, there were two categories, if there were supposed to be eight, because uh, the, the ones that are excluded are the ones that are account for the amendment. Neither is it an answer with the greatest respect to come up with this mental gymnastic exercise that says, okay, we, we might make a concession that we, the, this rule excluded certain people, but it was valid to the extent that it still included other people. That's what Mr. Tengov says. The fact that it, it was meant to cover 10 people and now it, it covers four people means that it's valid in respect of those four people. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. You can't amend a rule from a supreme body like the constitutional the constitution and, and then uh, trim it down to uh, two or three people. So in, the point I'm making is very simple. It doesn't matter whether you amend it upwards or downwards. An amendment is an amendment. So the fact that you now narrow it to three or four categories when it was meant to have 10 categories makes it invalid for two reasons. One, 
because the amendment per se is, is unlawful, but also because we have now doctored it to suit your own purposes, which we have uh, pleaded uh, very fully. So on either ground, the repurposing of the Nasrec rule was done for ulterior purposes of excluding certain people because of factional reasons, as we've explained, and excluding, and even now excluding people because of their so-called standing in the state. A qualification that uh, Nasrec did not make. Nasrec delegates knew that there are people who have positions in the state. So if they wanted to include to exclude them, they would have excluded them. It's not for the NEC to amend the resolution of Nasrec by uh, uh, exempting all sorts of people, premiers and uh, mayors and um, ministers and deputy ministers and presidents and deputy presidents. That is an amendment by any name. If the, 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 so if the only issue then between me and Mr. Trengove, having considered correctly that the power to amend <laughs> does not exist, is whether actually there was an amendment, then that, then two, prayers 2.1 and 2.2 must be granted with a smile. Um, because there, there is, uh, and, and even without a smile, I mean, if, if, if um, uh, it might be painful, but uh, the, the point of the matter is that the, the, um, the, the president and, and the ANC actually uh, 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 were exempted by this, what we call repurposing uh, exercise. And uh, the uh, rule that was ex ex exercised was, um, was, was, was invalid, ab initio in its own right, or by uh, the fact that, by, by, by the, uh, one, one last point. The, um, we, the, the, we were told, okay, I'm told it's not the, the last point. The, the, we were told that also there's Audi, but I don't think this is really a, a serious point. But we're told that um, the mere presence. If it's not serious, we won't we won't insist that you make it, Mr. <laughs> yes, but uh, well, I'm, I'm saying it was not serious on the part of Mr. Trengove. Okay. I hope, but he he said that the, the mere presence and participation of Mr. Mahashule in those NSC meetings <laughs> constituted Audi. Now, the, what that means really, I mean, the, this is a startling proposition. What it means is that, let's say, a member of parliament uh, who, 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 uh, against whom a, 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 a statute would be invoked would be precluded from raising it in a court of law, from saying, no, that statute uh, is unconstitutional. Why? Because they say, no, but you were in parliament when it was passed. You were there. You were present and you participated. Maybe you even voted uh, for it. I mean, that is completely uh, uh, out of this world. Uh, so the, 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 the presence and participation in some meetings, uh, le, le, I mean, let's I assume he participated. I he, think we get your point. Yeah. Yes, so, so the, 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 that, uh, the, those Audis are, are not are non Audis. Just one second. All right, then, um, the, okay, it's the 16.9, again, I, I'm not sure if it was ma made seriously, the 16.9 point, which says that um, Ms. Duwater could uh, somewhere just fall into the position. I, was, I, was, I just wanted to say tongue in cheek, in that case then, Mr. David Mabuza can also just uh, assume the position of the president of the ANC or a deputy minister can just assume the the position of a deputy uh, of, of of a minister, uh, if that is what is the meaning of the word uh, deputize. The point we are making in closing, uh, my lords and my lady, is that this was an exercise, and and for Mr. Uh, Trengov, oh well, it's not his fault. It's Miss uh, Duarte, I think, to to seek to deny that there is factionalism in the ANC. I mean, we know that the court has to, to be neutral and pretend that it's, it, it, it doesn't live in the real world. But <laughs> really, can anybody deny the fact that there were two factions, which were two major factions that were contesting, and that the president of the NC only last week 
I saw a headline where he says they must root out factionalism in the ANC. So if it's not there, wh what is there to root out? And this whole thing about renewal, which he lectures us in his affidavit, is supposed to be aimed at factionalism. But now the factionalism is a figment of Mr. Makhashule's imagination. And the conference resolutions say that they are addressing factionalism. It says uh, at, uh, the, the credibility and integrity dealing with corruption. An increase in corruption, factionalism, dishonesty, and other negative practices. The Integrity Commission, when it met with the president and the SG, highlighted the issue of factionalism. And this is why we're saying that these things were being done for factional purposes. Uh, but as I said yesterday, motive, on the question of amendment, motive is there just to give the context. But even if there were, it was not done for factional purposes, the NEC could not re-engineer and repurpose that resolution lawfully uh, or otherwise. Okay. So I'm afraid section uh, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 must be granted. As far as prayer three is concerned, that is the setting aside of the um, 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 suspension. That prayer, we accept that it belongs to the 721B leg of the of the of the inquiry, but the prayers in uh, 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3 are not in the discretion of the court. The court must grant those orders. Because why? Because this the right to participate under Section 19 has been abrogated, and two, the has been infringed, and two, there has been no Section 36 uh, limitation. And I heard again today the invocation of Paragraph 73 of Ramakatsa, which has no application in the 172A uh, inquiry. That is why in Ramakatsa the declarator was granted. That should be the telltale sign that that qualification has no place in a court of law. So it, it, it's completely irrelevant. The declarators are enough. The consequences of unconstitutionality are obviously invalidity. That, that uh, the many cases have said that. In the case in which Mr. Trengov and I were on the same yes. side yeah, uh, yeah. Of, 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 of the EFF Nkanta, it was said there that the it is obligatory. The court has no option in the matter. And okay. therefore, my lords and my lady, we implore this court to do the right thing, to find that um, irrespective of who is involved, there are... Um, there are transgressions of our constitution, and that is more important. It is more important to protect the constitution than to protect anybody. And that that uh, those uh, declarators must be granted. And um, the, 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 the rest of it, as paragraph 73 says, is in the province of the ANC. The ANC will know what to do uh, once those declarators are given. They will do the right thing as well. But first, before they do the right thing, it is for this court and the judiciary to do the right thing. Good. As a court. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mpofu. Um, well, I think that brings us to the uh, to the end of the argument over the last two days. We are mindful that this matter was brought to court on the basis of urgency, and that urgency at the end of the day wasn't really an issue, um, and that uh, we are enjoined to try and finalize the judgment uh, much sooner rather than later. And I think I can speak for the bench by saying that we, we commit ourselves to do it as quickly as possible, mindful that um, the application raises weighty issues um, of law. Um, you can be assured that uh, we will discharge our duties without fear, favor, or prejudice. Thank I think you. you said it might be painful, but uh, we, we are entrusted to do the work that the Constitution gives us to do and that the oath of office we take and joins us to do in that spirit. Uh, and um, we will communicate uh, with the parties through the normal course as to when the judgment will be delivered and the mode of the delivery of the judgment, whether it will be in open court or whether it will be uploaded onto the system via case lines. Mindful once again that we, particularly in Gauteng, are going through probably a, a very difficult time in dealing with this pandemic around us and we have to give consideration to that. And so finally, I'd just like to thank both the teams uh, as well as the teams that are not here who appeared for the intervention in the interventions applications for your assistance. 
uh, for your heads of argument that we found useful. And I suppose for um, the manner in which this uh, matter was argued. Uh, yes, I think uh, on that note, uh, court will adjourn then. And judgment is reserved. As the court pleases. Thank you, my lord. As court pleases, we're indebted to the court as well. And I know that I speak for my learned friends on the other side as well. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Good then. We will adjourn. <laughs> Can't be so unfortunate. <laughs>